this company. You're going to bankrupt your mama's company. At least I have the radio to keep me company. On 93.5 and 107.5, The Fan. Man, you want to talk about a loaded Friday. I'll tell you what. It is a loaded Friday, exactly that. And continued false summit spring, baby. Right? That's why I wore the shorts today. I'm going full skin into the uh, man, uh, you are wearing shorts. That is horrific, by the way. Absolutely horrific. But at least you have on a new, what appears to be washed Kansas City Chiefs t-shirt. I did wash it just for you. On the cusp of the Super Bowl, what number Super Bowl is this? I, I'm going to guess. I'm going to guess because I don't even know because I don't know Roman numerals. I don't know how to do Roman numerals. All I know is... We both know. I mean, I definitely know the Roman okay. numerals off the top. Maybe he doesn't, which, but I know what Which it is. Super Bowl was Super Bowl LV? It would have been 55. Where was that game? That was in Tampa Bay. Who was the moron that didn't think to the fact that they should have the Super Bowl LV in Las Vegas? Doesn't that seem like it would have made perfect sense? You know, I tell this to people when they ask me on the street sometimes how I would fix a problem, and I say, you know, why don't you ask Jake Query? Because more often than not, <laughs> if you just ask there, you'd probably have a good solution out of it. I have no idea who the moron was, Jake. It's a great question. Doesn't it seem like that would have been a natural yeah. fit? Uh, Super Bowl, I'm going to say it's 58. You're correct. Well done. That would be L-V-I-I-I, right? That is correct. How about that? Well done. Or, as I like to call it, L-V, me, me, me. There you go. Right? I mean, live me some me. I love me some me. <laughs> L-V, M- me, me, me. I love me some me. It's but- L-V the third, okay? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Fair enough. Here's the thing. We got a loaded show lined up today because you have Indiana and Purdue coming up this weekend, and it's hard to believe that IU and Purdue almost is not back burner, but there are other topics that are equally as big. Obviously, the Super Bowl comes into play, but also the news last night. If you did not watch, and it was a pretty arduous sled to wade through before it finally got to the meat of the matter, but last night at the NFL Awards presentation, which took place in... LV, me, me, me. They announced the 2024 Hall of Fame class. And there was a lot of question, a lot of speculation. We knew that Reggie Wayne and Dwight Freeney were finalists for the Hall of Fame. And Reggie Wayne, of course, has been on the ballot longer. Now, we had Dwight Freeney on with us when the finalists were announced. And I asked Dwight Freeney, Go ahead, Dwight, right now and spell your case. Tell me why number 93 should be in the Hall of Fame. And Dwight Freeney had this to say. Regardless of what happens, I I do know this. I left my mark on the game of football. I changed the game of football. And not too many players can say that. They didn't draft guys my size that high in the first round. Um, We were considered undersized, um, a tweener. Um, let's just say that. And now they don't say that that much. I know I changed the outlook on guys who are potentially undersized, right? I also know when you see a spin move, somewhere on that tree, of lineage tree, whatever, of spin moves, my name is somewhere on that tree, all right? So either a coach tried to emulate that based on film study or a direct correlation through a coach um, somewhere somehow there is some type of tie there they didn't teach really the spin moves that I did prior to me because they were ever it was always taught never turn your back to the quarterback all right and and that's all you did when you spun now you spin you're, you're losing side of the quarterback for a split second so when I see my spin move on video games When I see my spin move being used in college and high school and the pros, I know where it came from in some way, some fashion. So I I do feel great about that. Um, And and lastly, I think for me, I I played the game hard. I played it how it was supposed to be played. Maybe the stats may not show, because sometimes the sacks numbers lie. You know, sometimes you can get a sack and just be completely unblocked. You can get a sack if you get pancaked by your offensive tackle and the quarterback trips over you. And you can get a sack if the quarterback happens to run out of bounds and you have to be the closest person. So not all sacks are equally the same. I know I worked very hard for my sacks, and I know I had to sometimes fight through two guys to get there. 
and um, I'll put my tape up against anybody's that ever played. Well, he doesn't have to because after hearing his name called as the 11th pick in the 2002 NFL draft out of Syracuse where many people thought that he was undersized, many people thought that it was a stretch or a reach by the Colts and that Dwight Freeney could have been available in the late first round or even second round of that draft. And for a franchise that, truth be told, probably already had reached out beyond where many people thought they should have with a selection in the first round in earlier year with Edger and James when Ricky Williams was right there and people thought for certain that Ricky Williams would be the direction they would go, and the Colts selected Edron James, which seemed unconventional and controversial at the time, but obviously worked out. The same thing happened when the Colts selected Dwight Freeney, and then last night at the NFL Awards show in Las Vegas, Reggie Wayne and Dwight Freeney, both in the mix and finalists. You heard Dwight Freeney's case, and then this happened last evening. So Dwight Freeney heard his name called. Reggie Wayne, unfortunately, will have to wait for another time. And I think one would assume that Reggie Wayne will ultimately hear his name called. But Dwight Freeney is in on the program today, coming up in just under an hour. Just got confirmation. The man that made the selection for Dwight Freeney, Bill Pullian, will join us at 1 o'clock. Hopefully we can ask him about the state of the Colts today, that of Jim Irsay as well, but very curious to hear Bill Pullian's thoughts, recollections of seeing another of his selections taken into the hall where Bill Pullian currently sits. That is the Pro Football Hall of Fame in Canton, Ohio. Bill Pullian at 1 o'clock today. Zach Kiefer going to join us bottom of the hour. He is at the Super Bowl. Kevin Bowen at 2 o'clock today. And plenty to discuss about football, and IU Purdue over the course of today. But Jimmy Cook, I will begin with this. With all of that said, we'll talk plenty about all of that. How about last night, though, in terms of Hall of Fame? When we got off work yesterday, I had a meeting. I had to walk downtown about 4 o'clock. I walked out of our building and was walking down. I always forget if it's Washington or Maryland. I guess it would be Washington. And in front of the Conrad, I saw this swarm of people. And I thought, what in the world? And every kid from Hamilton County wearing Steph Curry jerseys, waiting outside the Conrad, loading up the buses for the Warriors to go over to Gamebridge Fieldhouse. And for those that were showing up to see Steph Curry play, the reality is the youngster, not youngster at this point, but the Hall of Fame player, future Hall of Famer out of Davidson did not disappoint last night, although it was disappointing for the Pacers. You want Pacers wins. Pacers fans want Pacers wins. But you cannot control if a superstar that arrives to your town is going to live up to the hype of their career every time they set foot in the building. You don't know if you're going to get to see something special happen. And again, I'm not trying to undercut the Pacers or any fans of the Pacers here, but if you're a neutral, if you were wearing a Warriors jersey, like the the Carmel Pups, like Jake always jokes about last night, or if you were a Pacers fan, when you see a player like Steph Curry on the schedule, and if you're lucky enough to have tickets, you hope to yourself, yes, the Pacers win, but he's going to put on a show. And my goodness, did he ever. That first quarter alone didn't miss from three. He's six of six from behind the arc. He has 18 points, finishes the half with 29 on 10 of 11 shooting. And then as that game went on, it's clear from a defensive standpoint, Pacers get wrecked in the first quarter and they never really recover with how to attack and try to eliminate a Warriors team that has shown vulnerabilities at time this season but as that game goes on now NBA Twitter's getting involved and you're starting to watch this game they're getting national eyeballs on it and now it's a matter of well maybe he's going to take down Clay Thompson's record Clay Thompson has the record for most three-pointers in a game in NBA history with 14 and so he flirts with that a little bit he only plays 30 minutes if this is a tighter game maybe he does get the opportunity but he finishes 11 of 16 from beyond the arc as I mentioned 42 points and just as 
quintessential a scoring display as you're ever going to see from one of the greatest, not just three-point shooters, one of the greatest players to ever step foot on a court. From the Pacers' side of things, I know it was a chaotic day yesterday, but the absence of Buddy Heald had kind of been felt the last couple of games for the Pacers, at least from a schematic standpoint. You knew what you were getting out of him on a nightly basis, and who knows, maybe he bounces back into form for Philadelphia the rest of this season. But they look like a team that had just gutted one of their star key pieces and didn't know how to function on either side of the ball. That's a little concerning, but where they're at right now still as an organization with a key road trip coming up, got to finish strong going to the All-Star break. There's not a reason to panic, but it was a little disappointing that it felt like they got either caught in the chaos of the trade deadline or got caught star watching when Steph drops 42 on you. You know, we've had time to now kind of sit and reflect on or or just let the dust settle a little bit on on the trades in general. Jimmy, I, I know that there are people that – and Mark Monteith did a really good job of, of going through, like, tr- big trades that the Pacers have made at the deadline and how it – in the past and how it affected them coming right off of that. And you do wonder if – you know, what this means for this particular group for the rest of the season. But, Jimmy, I want to go back to what we talked about yesterday and and caution people, I guess, a little bit. And I know it's disappointing because this team is really exciting and gets you intrigued. But the moves that took place yesterday, we don't know yet. They may have detriment on, on the 2024 Pacers. But the reality is these moves were more about the 2025, 2026, and 2027 Pacers. And that's a hard thing to grasp in the moment. But, I, but I'm but i hoping for Pacer fans that that will show itself and pay off in the long run. It's clear that's what the moves were about, and I'm with you. I hope that is what takes shape. This roster, as it stands, isn't drastically different than it was going to be this offseason. The chances of retaining Buddy Heald, even though you had his bird rights and you could have gone over the cap, which is what those allow you to do for those that don't know, you could have gone over the cap to retain him. It was clear they were too far apart. They tried to get negotiations done before the season started. It did not end in a deal, and they both decided to play things out and see where it went. The Pacers were very transparent in that process and told the media, this is a guy that we want to try to retain. We want to try to keep him. It was evident that wasn't going to happen, and based on what they have in front of them as a roster, it made more sense to move on and accelerate the development to some extent of some of your other pieces. We mentioned this when it happened yesterday, and I think you agree with this, Jake. This trade isn't just about 24, 25, 26 Pacers. It says more about the trust they have in the roster as it is right now that they've earned the ability to grow more. Benedict Matherin is the main name with that. Whether you ask somebody nationally or locally, he has the most to gain from the transaction that happened yesterday or transactions, which ultimately wound up being some cash, some second rounders going in and out, and Buddy Heald leaving and Doug McDermott coming back. That's basically what you wound up happening. Instead of having a piece that could create a logjam for growth while he was an incredible talent, you jettison him out and you bring in another veteran shooter while making it clear Benedict Matherin and to a smaller extent perhaps Jairus Walker and Ben Shepard are the beneficiaries of the trust and the opportunity that's being forced upon them it might not result in a four C this year it might not result in a playoff series win this year but the point you're hammering home is exactly right it is mapping out 24 25 and 26 and it's giving you flexibility because here's another thing that's interesting Earlier this year, I was at a Pacer game. And I'm sitting there and I'm watching. And I'm watching this guy come down. And it is amazing. The hand-eye coordination in the National Basketball Association is amazing. And I am the first to admit that I am very fortunate to have a good angle and a good viewpoint on that. I don't mean, I mean literally like in terms of where I sit at the games or where I'm fortunate enough to sit. And I think that when you get down that close is when you truly understand, Jimmy, you've done it. I mean, just how how fast the ball moves around and the 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 reaction time. I mean, it's unbelievable, right? 
and I'm watching all of it, and then I'm thinking to myself, and I say this a lot about the NBA that most marvels me. You look at every player in the NBA, and is that guy that you're watching that averages six points a game and 18 minutes a game for the Washington Wizards is out there dribbling the basketball. Somewhere in the United States, there are two guys sitting in a bar, and one is telling the story about how that's the greatest player from the history of his high school, and there are still legendary stories about the time he dropped 52 in middle school. Why you got to do Kyle Kuzma like that? What are you doing? Come on now. <laughs> that's right. Is he still there, by the way? He is. He He's survived. only been threatened to they trade like anything. 95 times, I know right? nobody cares here. The Wizards well, didn't do anything. They, they like, traded yeah, we're good. Daniel Gafford. Of Actually, real significance. Like, yes, they, they traded Gafford. Daniel yes. Gafford. Okay. The reason the Wizards didn't make any significant moves is because the rest of the league forgot they're around and didn't call them. Gafford right? matters, but moves that they thought were going to come off the books did not occur in Washington. But, they did nothing yesterday. But my point being, you know, every player in the league is just a phenomenal athlete that everywhere they have been has been the best player right. for the most part. And I'm watching – those things, and then I look at it and I go, in, in addition to that, every one of these guys, when they walk into a room at a restaurant, is the tallest person immediately when they walk in. T.J. McConnell looks like an Oompa Loompa on the floor, and he's like 6'4", 6 6'2", 6 maybe, but I mean, you know, I mean, he's my size, basically, right? And it is amazing, the size, the agility, all of it. And when you see a guy that's like 6'8", six, 6'9", six, that comes down on a fast break and just pulls up and, and effortlessly hits a three. And then you watch the lateral movement of said player. And I'm watching it. And I turned around to the people around me and I said, I'm watching this one particular guy. And you know what? That's exactly, exactly what the Pacers need. Their missing ingredient right now is that guy right in front of me that just pulled up and hit a 28-foot three effortlessly and then went on the other end and, like, collapsed defensively on the wing even with older knees and older legs than prior to when we have seen that player and the wingspan, the movement, everything else. That right there is exactly what the Indiana Pacers need. And this was bo before Pascal Siakam was wearing blue and gold. Now you have Pascal Siakam – who can score in a multitude of ways, probably still needs some help defense. You have Tyrese Halliburton that is facilitating for that. And the flexibility is there between the dreaded, quote, draft capital and salary cap maneuverability for them to get a third musketeer. I don't mean a third musketeer like a max contract in his prime Jason Tatum guy, but I mean a guy that when he comes in is an immediate starter and absolutely is the third guy on the poster. Aaron Neesmith's a really nice player. Probably not third guy on the poster yet. Miles Turner is a really, really good player, but offensively still, I mean, and I think Miles Turner does what Indiana needs better than anybody in basketball. He's a perfect fit for them. But in terms of with the offensive scoring and the ability to create for themselves, the guy, the missing ingredient now, and after the trade deadline, and after the dust had settled, and once the music started to fade and the credits on the 2024 trade deadline started to roll across your screen, at the bottom it said, Paul George, to be continued. Because there is rumor and I believe it. Yep. I believe this rumor. I absolutely believe it. There is rumor that Paul George, who liked living in Indiana, and I think truly liked the organization of the Indiana Pacers, Paul George, there were two things that I thought kind of did in Paul George's time in Indianapolis. Not the acquiring first, Anthony Davis? <laughs> I mean, that was the first, right? But, but right. honestly, symbolically speaking, yes. when he had the rumor that he thought they should go after Anthony Davis, and sure, probably the the Pacers knew there was no way they could acquire, financially speaking or through the assets necessary, Anthony Davis. But you at least appease that to Paul George. Sure. And Paul George's perception that Indiana did nothing to acquire him, that was number one 
And then number two, I still go back to this, is when Paul George was asked to play the power forward position, said he didn't want to, and Larry Bird uttered the famous words, Paul, don't make the decisions around here. And Paul George said, well, actually, I kind of do. But he never demanded a trade per se, but he went to, he had his agent go to Kevin Pritchard to simply say, I probably will look elsewhere, so it would be in your best interest to trade me after the, the famous softball game. He has one year left on his contract. I don't know, I'm not a cap numerologist, whether or not they could afford him for next season at $48 million. Probably not. But he is a an unrestricted free agent after that. And Paul George apparently has had whispers. Whispers. Not necessarily on a billboard, but whispers. That he would be interested in returning to Indiana. And I absolutely emphatically believe that that Indiana would absolutely have interest in Paul George returning. I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it is certainly absolutely A, intriguing, B, a good fit, and C, perfect for Sports Talk Radio. I don't know if this fits the conspiratorial bill or if this fits the rumor mill oh, bill. Do we have, the uh, by chance, the tinfoil hat for Jimmy Cook here? But this is, if it fits that range, my favorite conspiracy currently going on in the NBA. The thought that perhaps his conversation on his podcast with Tyrese Halliburton and him getting wistful about the Pacers and realizing that maybe things would be better off for the back half of his career in Indiana. This all happening, Jake, I'll let you and Eddie be the judge if it's more rumor or if it's really like you know, tall tale conspiracy, probably not likely to happen. I want to believe it and I want it to happen because I love a good story in sports. And this would be the full circle story of full circle stories of him departing, it being on bad terms, it looking like he forced his way out, whether or not that people still believe that or not to go on what three different teams eventually end up with the Clippers and then come back at a time where he is the perfect piece I want to believe it. I'll put on any amount of tinfoil hat to make it so. Thank you. That said, to your question about the contract idea of it, and we can throw this hypothetical again at Tony East next week, and I say that next week because he's one of the few people I really trust around the cap that we have on regularly, but Eddie and I have had conversations with him before off air. They would have to get very creative, and much like any other big star, the only way for it to happen would be via trade, either a sign-in trade, or maybe he opts into that player option, and then he's dealt. But you would have to get creative with the numbers and a lot of salary matching for it to occur without fully gutting the roster. And maybe your only choice would be to gut your depth and gut the roster to make it happen. But I'm all here for it, and I hope it does happen. When we're doing conspiracies in terms of the Pacers and their financial abilities moving forward, then I actually think, Eddie, if you play it one more time, doesn't that actually become the tinfoil cap? Yes, you're right. It does. Thank you. Man. Thank you. I think it's interesting, though. But but again. He has it. I don't mean to be Brian Windhorst here. People thought he was going to re-sign with the Clippers right after the Kawhi deal. And it hasn't happened yet. What does it mean? What, what does it mean? I don't know. But he hasn't put pen to paper yet. And a lot of it, I think, is going to be dictative on what they, they being the Clippers, do this season. How far do they go? Is it more likely he would do it if they win? And then he wants to, Look, he's good, he has his ring now. Or is it a first round exit? And he's like, I'm tired of being in LA. I don't know, but I want to find out. tell you the perfect out. scenario. Okay. Hollywood script level stuff. And I'll be honest, unpopular opinion here. And I'm going to put this out there. People can text me till the cows come home about how this is the worst thing I've ever said on radio. And I've said a lot of dumb stuff. Okay, and I'll give my number out right now because it's the weekend. I like hearing from people over the course of the weekend. 523-9288, right? It's a 317 area code, obviously. 523-9288. People can feel free to text me with this unpopular opinion. I would love to see a scenario that is a Hollywood script for the Indiana Pacers, partially because... While I loved it, loved, 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 loved it when I was on spring break 
in middle school and went and saw it in the theater in South Carolina and pushed my chest out with pride over the greatness of the story. And while I love, love, loved it, when it came out on VHS and you could go rent it at Blockbuster. Oh, no. And while I love, love, loved it, watching it occasionally on a snowy winter day. I don't like where this is going. I'm going to have to text you now. And I still think it's a great movie. Oh, no. But if I wasn't from Indiana, I would think the obsession over a film that is now. It's not too late. Mind you. You can still change your mind. The movie itself is now older than the story it told upon its release. It is time for another Hollywood script to relieve us of the weird obsession You're, all the time about Hoosiers. Oh. Great movie. Don't get me wrong. Great movie. Or Gene Hackman. But like the jerseys when the Pacers wore it, it was cool for a year. They did it for like seven years in a row, and it was like, ugh. I love when they still doing just this. dipped Boomer in red dye. They just showed up, and he's <laughs> I mean, red and gold. So the Hollywood script that I would love to see for the Indiana Pacers is this. Boils on the mic. Seven seconds to go in game seven of the NBA Finals. Cambridge Fieldhouse is rocking and rolling. And the Los Angeles Clippers have broken the huddle. They lead by two. Indiana with the ball, half court, taking it out of bounds. Neesmith will inbound, right? Ball Pacers game. in game seven. Thank you. They are down two in the NBA Finals. And the ball's inbounded. And Neesmith looks, and he gets it into Halliburton. Halliburton drives, and the double comes. And he finds in the corner, wide open for three, the Miles former Turner. Pacer, now returned to the Pacers. The former Clipper, Paul George. Playoff fee, baby. With the ball in his hands with three seconds to go. And ball in the game. Hollywood script of all Hollywood scripts, Everybody in the field house is all saying the exact same thing. Pass the damn ball. <laughs> there it is. Don't shoot it. And he kicks it off to Tyrese Halliburton, who hits the three to win the Pacers, their first NBA championship. We Wouldn't all have PTSD wonderful? from a Gatorade ad. I don't know if you're familiar of with course. that specific. That's of why Eddie course. kept saying ball By game. the way. Of course. Tyrese Halliburton and Paul George share the same agent. See? <clears throat> See? There you go, Eddie. It was the time. That was the time to do Who's it. Who's the one with the size eight and a half now that's putting on the tin foil cap? There it is. Zach Kiefer is covering the Super Bowl. He is out in lost wages, and we just pulled him off of a craps table long enough to join us. He's going to do it next. Bill Polian, one o'clock. Kevin Bowen, two o'clock. Still efforting the guy that got into the Hall of Fame last night, but I'm guessing he's probably still sleeping in Las Vegas. Dwight Freeney as well. Uh, we'll see about that. But you're listening on a Friday to Quarry and Company on 93.5 and 107.5 The Fan. $5,000. That's the...
Just firing up what is my favorite song not named Down Under of the 80s. Eddie Grant, baby. Out in the streets. Out in the streets, there is violence. Great song. Uh, joining us now, and I'm sure thrilled to be doing so, he is in the streets of the Strip of Las Vegas, where I'm going to be actually, guys, two weeks from today. Please hold your envy. Uh, Zach Kiefer joining us from The Athletic. He is out there for the Super Bowl, has a very interesting column right now talking about whether or not Kansas City has become the dreaded foe of the Indianapolis Colts. We will get to that. But, Zach, before we get to the stuff about the Super Bowl, I want to get your reaction to Dwight Freeney getting in and Reggie Wayne having to wait another year. Were you surprised by either? No, and I hate this for Reggie. I know Indianapolis does as well. With Freeney, I think we we debate this, we look at the stats, all this discussion. I think the more I do this job, the more you can answer these questions in very simple terms. When you watch Dwight Freeney, when he was really good for a long time, he had the look of a Hall of Famer, right? You can tell when you see it. And this is another one that Bill Polian drafted in Indianapolis. This is ridiculous. I mean, Peyton and Marvin and Edgerin and Freeney the coach and the executive as well. So I just feel like Freeney, and I had a really good conversation with Jason Peters this season. I profiled him. He's been in the league 20 years, one of the best tackles that have ever played. I said, who was the toughest guy to block? And this guy blocked Strahan and Jason Taylor and all these studs over all these years. The Bosa is now Miles Garrett. And he did not hesitate, Jake. He said, Dwight Freeney. And I said, really? And, he, and I said, why? And he said, because everything looked the same. Every move he was doing started out exactly the same. Everybody listening watched Freeney with that epic spin move that started on a soccer field, actually. It started when he was a goalie in the high school soccer team. So really happy for Freeney. I hate it for Reggie. And I think, honestly, to be honest, I think there's a Colts fatigue in the draft room, in, 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 excuse me, in the, in, a, in the Hall of Fame room. I think they're tired of putting Colts in, and that's that's the byproduct of all those great players and all that success. But I think those guys on the outside are kind of like, oh, we just can't put another Colt in. So I hope Reggie gets it next year. But Freeney had the look of a Hall of Famer. He played like a Hall of Famer, and that spin move going to Canton. Zach, do you think that Reggie Wayne in terms of – I mean, I, obviously you could say log jam at the receiver position. Andre Johnson gets in over Torrey Holt, which surprised me a little bit. But do you think – it? And maybe neither of these is the case. But do you think that Reggie Wayne from a national – I'm not talking about guys like me and you and and those that are listening that saw Reggie Wayne playing like game in, game out. But to to national folks, do you think Reggie Wayne is hurt a little bit more so by the fact that he was lining up alongside Marvin Harrison and so people go, well, I mean, you know, the numbers were skewed for that. Or – because he was on the receiving end of throws from Peyton Manning, and people go, well, I mean, you know, he was on the receiving end of, of, a, of a legendary quarterback. It's both, Jake, and, and, and I, I don't necessarily think that's fair. But I understand these, these voters, there's 50 of them, they have a difficult job, right? You have to separate great and great and great. And I think there is a fatigue with the Colts, but also what you said, Marvin's game was flashier. I think Marvin was the better receiver. And there is something to be said for in that room, those guys thinking, well, he played with Peyton Manning. Andre Johnson, who just got in, didn't play with any great quarterbacks. And I've talked to Andre about this. The minute he got to Indianapolis, remember he was a Colt for for a blink of an eye. I asked him about the quarterbacks he played with. And he said, look, man, I've been in here for two weeks, and this guy is better than every quarterback I've ever played with. And that was Andrew Luck. He could tell already. So I think from a national perspective, they think about that. But also – when it came to Reggie, and this is the beautiful thing about Reggie's game, he was so incredibly dependable, right? He was an Iron Man. He played every game for like 11 years. And I wrote late in his career about, you know, what was your secret? Because like I said earlier, it wasn't the speed of Marvin. Reggie had great hands. Marvin probably had better hands. And he didn't have the size of an Andre Johnson or all those guys, the Randy Mosses. And Reggie said, look, man, it was in the work. Like, he was one of the greatest route runners of all time. And that's not my words. Those are Bill Belichick's words. So, it wasn't as flashy and it wasn't as sexy. I think Indianapolis understands how great Reggie was because they watched him every day. And they knew that 87 was going to be on his side and he was going to do his job. Nationally, they didn't get to watch every single game. They didn't get to see and feel and hear the consistency. And, and unfortunately, that's just how it is. 
National NFL writer for The Athletic, Zach Kiefer, is our guest. You can follow him on Twitter, at Z Kiefer. Zach, you had a piece today that released on The Athletic headline with latest Super Bowl run, Chiefs would-be dynasty, echoes Patriots way. Look, I don't want to make Jake and Eddie and the rest of our audience barf, but it's clear I'm a Chiefs fan, so anytime I see an article like this, not just because it's from you, I'm going to dive in, I'm going to read it, but the idea even seven years ago of Kansas City being looked upon and viewed as an all-time great franchise is ludicrous to me still, even with what's happened. When you examine this piece and you turn the clocks back to one of the Colts' most notable foes in the New England Patriots and those dynasty years, what did you uncover and what similarities are at stake from a legacy standpoint for the Kansas City Chiefs on Sunday? Yeah, Jimmy, when I when I think about watching and covering those Patriots runs for 20 years, and I was in Indianapolis, so you always view it through that lens, right? They were the roadblock, right? And as we shift into this new era that's really owned by Reed and Mahomes and Kelsey, there's one word that comes to my mind. And in talking to players and executives and coaches this week, it comes back to that. And this run by the Chiefs this year speaks to this. This one word is inevitability. And it feels like the Chiefs have taken that mantle from the Patriots. And by that, I mean, this is the year they were supposed to get beat. This was the year they were supposed to go home early. They were not a great team in the regular season. They were 11-6. and six. They were road underdogs twice in the playoffs. And yet, I was in Baltimore a couple of weeks ago watching the Chiefs hoist another AFC championship. And for a long time in the AFC, everything went through Foxborough. And there were years they were beat for sure. I actually had a great conversation with Teddy Bruschi for the story, and Indianapolis will love this. So the Colts beat the, Chief, the Patriots in that epic AFC championship game, and Bruschi went up to Peyton after the game and said, congratulations on winning the Super Bowl. And Peyton said, well, we haven't won it yet. And he said, Bruschi said, well, you're playing Rex Grossman. That's what it meant for Indy to get past the Patriots. It wasn't about the Bears. It was getting past the Patriots. That's become the new normal for Kansas City. This team has an inevitability about them, and I mean that in the best way. And talking to Mahomes and Kelsey this week, those two have talked about what the Patriots did, the cost of winning and the, the cost of sustaining that. And, and it's really hard to stay on top. Like Clark Hunt, the owner, said, it's great to win one, but it's really hard to win another. We haven't had a back-to-back champ in 20 years since Brewski's Patriots in 2004. So – it's really fascinating to think about the mantle being passed really in that 2018 AFC championship game at Arrowhead. And now the roadblock is Kansas city and they don't even have to have a great regular season to get to the super bowl. And, and, and the one thing I'll leave you with is this. You asked Travis Kelsey about dynasties this week. And he said three, he said three is a really big number when it comes to dynasties. They know what's at stake on Sunday. This is not about championships. This is, this is Teddy Bruski's words. It's no longer about championships for the Chiefs. It's about legacy, and it's about becoming one of the greatest teams to ever play. Zach Kiefer is our guest. Zach is out (laughs) in Las Vegas for the Super Bowl. He writes for The Athletic. Zach, one of the things that always interests me, in particular with Super Bowls, but just in any big-time sporting event, is that oftentimes when you are at the event itself, in particular when you've been there as you have for a few days leading into it, Sometimes storylines creep up that you didn't anticipate going into it, and people start talking about it, whether it's something involving that game or something within the league itself on the external of said game. Anything jump out at you since you've been in Vegas that fits into that mold? Let me ask you this, Jake. I had an opportunity to get a general admission ticket to see you two at the Sphere, and I turned it down, not because of the money, because I didn't want to be in the GA section and just basically tilt my head all the way up and not be able to see. Do you think I'm crazy? I don't, and I'll tell you why. For those that are unfamiliar, the sphere itself, you have, you know, it is exactly that, and it's a basically a high-def television screen at 365 degrees all around you, right? And I hear that the floor, the GA for the floor, is great in, in terms of proximity to the band, but you are, in fact, looking up and – I heard that from the time you get in there, you're looking at like four hours without a seat itself. Now, I'm going to it in two weeks for the show, and I did go ahead and buy a seat for that because the general mission was was tempting, Zach, but they're not inexpensive, yeah. and I don't think my neck could, could withstand it. 
Yeah, I, I want to do the sphere. I want to do it right. Is the sphere so, kind of a storyline of the Super Bowl? Because I think a lot of people probably were planning on double dipping with it, right? Yeah, a lot of people are talking about it, the, the, the media that's in town for the first time. I mean, to answer your question, it's really weird. It's a really weird Super Bowl week, if you ask me, because my hotel is inside of a casino. And I come down for coffee at 5.30, 5.45 in the morning because I'm still on Indiana East Coast time. And there's gamblers that are still gambling, and they're not they're not just waking up. Are you aware like, of the two guys own. that I do this show with, Zach? I mean, you, you know, come on. 1-800-9-WITH-IT, right? It's, it's kind of inspiring. Like, if you're still <laughs> at it at 5.30 in the morning, like, it's just a weird vibe. And so I haven't even put down a chip yet because I even have, haven't really come up for air. I've been working, and, and just it's just really weird to have a work week in Las Vegas. But – for all the questions about, you know, is the NFL going to embrace Las Vegas and its gambling culture? I mean, I get off the plane on Monday, and I'm walking through the Las Vegas airport, and there's like 25 slot machines with NFL teams on them. And I'm just like, for 50 years, you guys pretended this city doesn't exist, and now you want everybody to embrace it. I get it. They're going to make a ton of money. They're growing the brand, all that. But it's just, it's just got a weird feel. I will add this last thing. I have heard so many times this week, because, you know, transportation and getting around the city hasn't been super easy. I've heard so many times this week about how much people love the Super Bowl in Indianapolis, and they haven't been to one since just as good. So that leads to my question, Zach, of Indianapolis does such a good job with it that it led to Indianapolis becoming in a, in a permanent rotation for the Final Four with big events like that. Vegas being Vegas, I cannot – fathom the possibility that this would be the only Super Bowl there and rather and maybe this has already been announced I don't know seems to me like Vegas would be in a permanent rotation for the Super Bowl your thoughts yeah I mean think about where it is next year it's New Orleans which is another one that's just in the rotation the sad thing for for us right for us small city in Minnesota same thing great stadium great venue they got one you know, they built their new stadium. They got their Super Bowl. Indianapolis built a great new stadium, got their Super Bowl. Everything went perfect. It couldn't have gone better. We had like 60 degrees, which has been nicer than it's been here this week. And it doesn't feel like it's happening again. The host committee has tried and made a really good pitch a couple of years ago and just didn't get it. But, you know, it comes back to the people in the NFL know Indianapolis because everybody comes in for the combine. And we were talking last week about how the Combine might go to L.A. and it might go to Dallas and how everybody is so relieved that that's going to be an Indy for the next couple of years. It's really sad Indy couldn't get in that rotation, but it's also not surprising knowing this league. Zach, in terms of the two that are in it, San Francisco and Kansas City, um, you know, Kansas City's been there, obviously. San Francisco has as well. I mean, you know, the, this is a rematch, so to speak. But can you get a sense at all? in terms of just kind of the approach and the balance between business trip and soak it in? And is there any difference in that approach between the two franchises? Yeah, that's a good question. I can speak a lot more to the Chiefs. I've been with them every day this week. Um, it was interesting, Travis Kelsey revealing the other day on Wednesday that they got into a little scuffle during practice. O-line and D-line for the Chiefs were getting into it. Had to be separated a little bit. Now, he said he loved that, but I thought this was the ultimate flex that I heard all week was Patrick Mahomes on Monday night saying, you know, this is nothing new for me. I just go back into my Super Bowl week routine. This guy's played in four Super Bowls in five years, and he has a Super Bowl routine. I mean, every player in the league wants to have a Super Bowl routine because they've been going to these games that much. I think that's the separation. Is The Chiefs absolutely know what to expect. They've done this four out of five years. They know how the week works. They know how the temptations come later in the week when practice stops. They will have a practice today. It's closed to the media and a walkthrough tomorrow. But for the Niners, I mean, if you're going to do it, 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 it's time to do it. It's just hard. You know, I think the two storylines not, pe- not a lot of people are talking about is the Chiefs' defense is really, really, really good. I think it's better than the Niners. And the fact that it doesn't matter how poorly the Chiefs play for two quarters or three quarters or three and a half quarters, this could play out just like the last one between these two did. 15 always finds a way, it seems like, in the end. And I think this is a legacy game for Patrick Mahomes. I think he knows that. And I think that, you know, just being comfortable in this uncomfortable situation of the Super Bowl matters a ton. The other side of the coin, Brock Purdy, first one 
We'll see if he can handle it. But Mahomes is so much more prepared for these kind of moments. National NFL writer for the Athletic, Zach Kiefer, is our guest. Zach, two rapid-fire ones for you real quick here. You mentioned you've been following the Chiefs all this week, so i got to ask, as I understand it, the home team gets to have first dibs on interview times and practice times. Have you gotten over your frustration with Andy Reid for setting the 8 a.m. call time uh, for some of those interviews? It doesn't bother me because I'm up at 6 anyway. And <laughs> okay. also, i got to say, it's, you know, the, Travis Kelsey literally was – sang to yesterday a Taylor Swift song, and he handled it pretty well. The Chiefs have been a lot of fun to cover this week. Be honest, you don't have to name names, but Radio Row's a crazy place. How many finger guns or handshakes have you given to people on Radio Row that knew you that you genuinely had no idea who they were or couldn't place the name? Yeah, um, I'm going to say a dozen, a dozen (laughs) or so, just yesterday in the afternoon, just like, Honestly, I don't want to be – if they have a Colts shirt on sometimes, and I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, but no, it's – Radio Row is absolute circus. It's an absolute circus out here. Yeah, you know what you do. You just walk around, and everybody goes, you good? You good? What's up, man? You, you good? Everything good? And then you go to the final we were, four, and they're all in sweatpants. Hey, coach, you good, coach? You good, coach? Yeah, good, coach. That's all you do, right? I was sitting at the athletic table, and a woman walked up and said, I don't know if you guys want to interview the voice of SpongeBob SquarePants, but you can have him anytime you want this <laughs> afternoon. And I'm like – I got to go, man. I got to go. This is when I've been here too long. You got to go do the interview is what you mean, right? You didn't, you didn't leave. You, you picked that opportunity and ran with it, right? Now, if it was Bluey or one of the shows that my kids watch, sure, sure. I would have done that in two seconds and my kids would have loved me. However, not, they're not SpongeBob kids. So I just, I just, I had other things to do. Okay, Zach, lastly, we were talking about this last week. So I want your opinion on it. Media Hotel was the Luxor and I realized that they had overflow and the Luxor has the pyramid and the tower. Uh, if you don't mind divulging it in case there are any stalkers listening, but are you in the Luxor? Yeah, I'm in the Luxor. I'm okay. in the tower. So, so how is it? Because I heard, I've heard mixed reviews. I mean, it's not that old, but everybody tells me it's too old and it's outdated. Uh, is it sufficient? It's fine. The yeah. room's fine. It's not my favorite spot. And I was talking about this with someone else the other day, like, I get it. The NFL is not going to put the media in the Bellagio or Caesars, right? Like, what world are we living in here? How was the chip? The Dorito chip when you walk in? How, how is it? Was, oh, was it as breathtaking it, yeah. as, as, you, as you expected? It smelled like nacho cheese like we thought it might? No. I'm kind of disappointed. I'm like, I'm ready. I haven't had a Doritos in a while, but I'm like, I'm ready, and I haven't seen them anywhere. It's a, they're just teasing us, man, with the decorations. I mean, look, I, we've all been to theme parks before. There's a way to get a nacho cheese scent coming out of there when you cross the threshold of the hotel. I don't know what we're doing. Missed opportunity. Yeah, there was some kind of, like, event or party the other day for Lay's where they had, a like, a ton. It, it's, just, it's hard to describe this place. This oh, weekend. there are plenty of parties for Lay's in Las Vegas, believe you me. I mean, you know what I mean? Yeah. Hey, Zach, words, lastly, Jake. how much were GAs uh, – so second lastly for me here. Uh, general admission to the sphere, what kind of price range were you talking? I've heard it get down – it got down to as low as 200 for Saturday night, but what was the price you were thrown? That's what I heard. That's what I heard. But, like, honestly, man, I would have paid – for a seat this weekend for that show in that venue, I would have paid I would have paid twice that. But Yeah, um, well, I did. I'm, I can yeah, tell I you. Yeah, I think I made the right choice. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring my wife back. We'll do it the right way. Actually, uh, three times, truth be told. Uh, Zach, appreciate yeah. it. We will look for your coverage in the athletic of the Super Bowl, especially from the Chiefs side of things. But really good column are the Chiefs, the new Patriots from Zach Kiefer at the Athletic. Appreciate it, Zach. Thanks, guys. All right. Again, Super Bowl coverage with Zach Kiefer out in Las Vegas. Ten minutes from now, the guy that drafted Dwight Freeney, Bill Pullian, the Hall of Famer himself, joins us at the top of the hour. March starts here. The Barbasol Horizon League.
I thought last night the NFL awards show was a little bit choppy, truth be told. Like, it just seemed there were some spots where it was just really awkward and weird. Like, all of a sudden, like the production quality, I mean. Nothing against people on the stage or the awards. Just, like, at one point, they just, like, the slate went, the NFL network feed went out. And maybe that was the cable I was on. I don't know. But it was just, it looked weird. And I was watching it. And I, granted, I understand why they do it. They bury the lead so that you have to, to wade through. And then the announcement that Dwight Freeney's in the Hall of Fame, and the first thing I thought to myself was, you know what? Bill Pullian, when he drafted Dwight Freeney, there was a lot of chatter, a lot of laughter about it. And now he's watching Dwight Freeney get in the Hall. Same thing took place with Edron James. And I thought, I would love to know what Bill Pullian thinks of this. So I looked. Realized that I had a way to get a hold of him and said, is there any way at 1 o'clock tomorrow that you could join us and I could try to find out exactly that? And he said, yeah, I'd be happy to. So that's what we're going to do next. The Ride with JMV.
thought was a very cool manner of doing it, the kind of the stage rising up, and there was Dwight Freeney as a new inductee, soon to be inductee into the Pro Football Hall of Fame. And joining us now on the program is a guy who will welcome him while wearing his own gold jacket. And in addition to that is the man responsible for selecting Dwight Freeney as a Colt. He needs no introduction in Indianapolis. Bill Polian joins us on the program. Bill, how are you? I'm fine, thank you, Jake. I appreciate that you're you're having me. Well, listen, I, I thought last night, and I want your your reaction to this statement. And I know that Edron James was a bit unconventional, if you will, with the pick because of Ricky Williams and all of that at that time. But I thought that Dwight Freeney's selection to the Hall of Fame is the ultimate feather in the cap on the resume that needs none of Bill Pullian because it was at the time a pick that was so widely questioned by people. What was your reaction when you saw or learned that Dwight Freeney would join you in the hall? Well, I was, I was over the moon. I mean, uh, anytime you get one of your players um, selected to the hall of fame, it's, it's a tremendous day. And, uh, and, and Dwight is so deserving. Uh, he, he played such a huge role for us. Um, I, I'm, I, I know Tony feels this way too. I think, you know, we're all gratified to, to see the people who did so much to create this great record in Indianapolis being honored. So, you know, Reggie's time is going to come soon. I think, uh, Jeff Saturday's time will come soon. Adam Vinatieri, as soon as he's eligible, uh, will be in. And, and so I, I think, you know, it, it, it feels wonderful to, to see those guys get the credit that, that they deserve uh, because they, they were such a great group of guys and a great team. Let's go back to 2002. Ooh, I forgot Robert Mathis. I, I was going <laughs> to wait to the end to ask that one, right? Like, wait a minute. Yeah, I apologize, yeah. <laughs> but, but let's go back to 2002, Bill Polian, where you're on the clock, the Colts are going to select 11th, and Dwight Freeney out of Syracuse is there, and, uh, and everybody, all the chatter – is that he's a late first round, early second round pick, et cetera. What did you see from Dwight Freeney's collegiate time that led you to believe, yes, in fact, this is the guy that I need? Well, we saw a player who dominated at the collegiate level who had all the traits necessary to be an outstanding defensive end, not only in the in our system, but in the National Football League. But for our system, he was ideal. And um, and he he if he'd been six feet four, he's probably the first or second guy off the off the board. But at six one or whatever he was, he didn't fit the mold. And so as we debated the choice, uh, there was another tackle from Georgia whose name I can't remember who was in the conversation and he was almost the polar opposite of, of Dwight. He was a defensive tackle about six, five, you know, maybe three ten, uh, who didn't have nearly the quickness of, of Dwight or the speed of Dwight, but was a very good power player. Charles and, Grant, uh, by the way, I think is who you're thinking of. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, the name escapes me, but anyway, uh, that debate went, pretty close to to H hour, you know, the day before the draft. And Tony and I uh, happened to be side by side on the treadmills um, that afternoon. And I said to him, you know, we're, we're, we're in a dead heat here. Uh, what, what's your thinking? And he said, Bill, I'll take speed, all things being equal, I'll take speed anytime, all the time. So I said, great, that's exactly how I feel. We're going to pick Dwight Freeney. <laughs> and uh, so that's what we did. The noise didn't bother us one iota because we had decided early in the process uh, when Tony came on board that in the salary cap era, you can't afford to be locked into a uh, concrete template or, or cast in stone template that says a guy has to be this tall and, and have this much wingspan. There were three tests basically that we applied to a player 
It was the triangle drill. It was the 40 yard dash and it was the production test. And if they, and, and obviously character, if, if that was good, we were good. We weren't going to get hung up on the fact that a guy was six, one instead of six, four, if he could change games. And that's what Dwight did. And interestingly enough, the scuttlebutt, the only scuttlebutt that, that bothered me at all was the fact that and Mr. Ursay actually asked me about it, that, that Xavier McKinney had shut him out in, in Syracuse's game against Miami. So Jim asked me about it. I said, let me go back and look at the film and just be sure of it. And so I went back and looked at the film. And Dwight only had one sack in that game. And that was the one time that Xavier McKinney didn't double team him. <laughs> <laughs> so he, he beat Jay McKinney one on one for a sack the rest of the time. Every other play they double teamed it. So, you know, so much for that scuttle, but but other than that, it didn't bother us at all. We we were convinced that we were you, you never convinced you're getting a Hall of Famer, that's really a stretch. But we were convinced we were gonna get a player that was gonna be a long time star for us. You know, I had always heard Bill Poley and and, and the assumption always was that part of why Freeney and Robert Mathis, for that matter, were were such good fits for what you wanted to do was that you knew that often teams, oftentimes teams were going to have to be passing to come from behind because of the prolific offense that you had, and that when you combine that with playing indoors on turf, that first step speed was so important on your bookends to be able to come in and take advantage of sitting duck quarterbacks. Now, is that – typical radio talking head over analysis or was there some truth to that strategy and thought of it there's truth to it it's, it's partially true um the idea of, of of uh the opposition playing from behind really didn't focus that was not a, a focus of ours what we said was in order to be a successful team in this era and, and in this salary cap era which which severely constrains you know, who you can pay and how many you can pay. Uh, we need to have guys who can close games, meaning pass rushers who can affect the passer uh, when you're trying to close a game in the fourth quarter, when you're trying to get out of and get the ball back at the end of the second half, at the end of the first half, uh, when you have to stop a drive on third and six that they can affect the passer. And, and so that was the thinking. It had little to do with the fact that we were going to be playing from, uh, from ahead. Uh, and, and, in fact, that, that really wasn't totally true because I think Peyton still holds the record for fourth quarter comebacks. So <laughs> there wasn't a lot of, you know, we weren't playing from ahead all the time. The idea that we played on turf and in a division where we in effect played 11 games a year in perfect weather was a factor. That was a factor. Uh, I'm not sure if we had been the New York Giants, for example, playing in the Northeast in that terrible weather, uh, you know, from mid-November on that. I think we still probably would have taken Dwight, but it wouldn't have been the slam dunk that, that, that it was for us. The fact that we played on grass and in, uh, I'm just sorry on turf in uh, in, in ideal weather situations w was uh, was a factor. We we took that into consideration. Hall of Fame executive and Colts great Bill Polian is our guest. Bill, you mentioned earlier when reflecting on drafting Dwight that you didn't know at the time that he was going to be a Hall of Famer. Very rarely do you, but you thought he was going to be a great player with the gift of hindsight now that he is a hall of famer and you look back on his career were there any moments where you felt like man this guy's on a hall of fame path oh yeah absolutely sure um you know as he became a dominant force in the league and uh and our defense we finally got our defense put together with enough players to 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 be able to affect the game and not not just hang on and try to win uh, he and Robert were driving forces, and of course Bob, for the brief time that that that, that he was healthy, uh, we had a dominant defense. And when you have a dominant defense, it's it's almost always led by dominant pass rushers, and and those guys have a really good chance to get to the Hall of Fame. So as the sack numbers and the sack fumble numbers uh, mounted, it, it was pretty evident that that he was 
headed on that path. Now, you can't ever predict it, uh, obviously, because it's a vote of 50 people in a room, and, and, and that, that's, that's the most unpredictable. I I'm, I'm happen to be a selector, but I can tell you it's the most unpredictable thing you can ever, <laughs> you ever run across. But uh, uh, he, he was on the path maybe halfway through his career, you could, you could say, well, you know, if, if please God, he stays healthy, this is going to, this is likely to end in Canton. Bill, for you, Bill Polian, our guest, you were inducted. You got that call. You got the knock on the door in the jacket in 2015. Dwight Freeney, the world learned last night will be in the class of 2024 for you personally. And, and let's just say that it's parallel with what Dwight will go through. When did it truly, though, sink in? When did you, Bill Polian, realize, you know, 100 years from now, a kid's going to look at my face on a bust and they're going to learn about Bill Polian and I am a football Hall of Famer? How long did it take for that reality to truly sink into you? It really didn't sink in until um, I went to the, my wife and I went to the orientation session which occurs the day in those days, the day after the Super Bowl. I don't know if that's it's that's going to be the case this year, but w- when they started talking about you know getting measured for your jacket and 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 what the ceremony was going to be like and what the future was going to be like, then it really sunk in. Until that time, it was a kaleidoscope of 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 things that happened and people that called and. Uh, all of the, you know, the, the lead up to it, worried about, are you going to make it? Or are you not? Uh, I, I was, I resigned to not making it. I, because it never occurred to me in my entire life until, until I was nominated that, that, that I would ever have a chance to make it. So it was, it, it was all new in Dwight's case. He's been a finalist before. And so I think he was a little more prepared for it, but, it really sunk in at that orientation meeting. Do you only go to restaurants now that are jacket required? Because I'd wear it everywhere, right? <laughs> I mean, I'd, I'd create excuses to where I have to wear it, right? <laughs> no, no, no. Uh, I really only wear it. Uh, uh, my, wife, my wife likes to say state occasions. <laughs> uh, you know, when, 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 we're, when we're at the hall or involved in a, in a hall function, I do wear the ring quite often. And, um, and and that's uh, obviously a prized possession as well, um, but the the, uh, uh, the jacket stays in, in its in its case unless it's a, a big time Hall of Fame occasion. Bill Polian, our guest. Bill, you had mentioned earlier, and I know certainly of your mutual respect and the way that you worked alongside and for Jim Irsay. Uh, it is well known in Indianapolis and within the football worlds that he has gone through a health struggle of late. Uh, what was your last communication with him, or just how much are you kind of kept abreast of his situation and his health? Um, people in the organization have kept me abreast, which I'm very grateful for. Um, my la- I texted him, uh, I want to say, oh, a week ago, and I'm going to text him again today, um, you know, talking about sharing our joy in, in, in Dwight being chosen. Uh, I know he, he he loves that. I mean, he gets it really – thrilled about having his guys in the hall of fame so he he was interactive with that uh yeah yeah yes yes i I was i was aware that he got the message um and and and, you know just praying for him obviously uh it's a serious situation and 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 you hope that in in the end it, it it comes out okay and from what i'm told and i'm glad to see that he made the statement that that he's on the mend um, so uh, I think that's a wonderful thing. I've, al- I've always, anybody that asks, I- I've always said that of all the people that I worked for in this business, the one most knowledgeable about football uh, as an owner was Jim Irsay. And he has very few peers in the league in that regard. Very few owners know football the way he does. And working for him is a joy in that sense because uh, a conversation that would take me two hours with, with, with another owner relative, for example, like drafting Dwight Freeney. Why are you drafting a guy that uh, all the gurus say doesn't belong in that slot in the draft? It, you know, took me 10 minutes to explain it to Jim. He understood it completely. He, I, I know he watched film and, and knew what he was looking at. So it was 
he's he's as big a part as as anybody in the success that we had because he's a died in the wool football man and uh, Indianapolis is lucky to have him. Hall of Famer Bill Polian is our guest. Bill, when you look at the state of the NFL right now, how different is the team building process than when you were building those Colts teams and even further back those Bills teams? Well, the Bills teams are very different because that was pre-cap. The cap era now has – the only thing that's changed is that the number of zeros on the contracts are larger. Uh, The effect on the cap 31 years after it was put in place uh, is still the same. It provides competitive balance. Um, if you if you have good ownership and good management and good coaching and good players, you're going to win. You can, yeah, but you have to find ways to win. It's not easy to do what we did um, for as long as we did it. Um, Ten years, twelve years in, in the playoffs. Um, th- that's really really hard to do because the cap is designed to prevent you from doing that. It's literally designed to prevent you from doing that. So uh, the fact that we did it for as long as we did uh, is a real accomplishment. The fact that the Chiefs have have been up there as long as they have is a real accomplishment. That's not what's supposed to happen. Uh, And that's true of the rest of the league. So you still have to be really creative, and and you uh, you have to have a formula to win. Uh, over the long term, and you have to have the Dwight Freenies, the Peyton Mannings, the Edger and James, the, the, the Robert Mathis, the Jeff Saturdays, the, the, the Marvin Harrisons, the Reggie Waynes. You have to have them, and, and hopefully you have them for a long time. That's the secret of it, and, and that's what it takes to win. That hasn't changed since the cap came in. But the cap is is a is a huge impediment to winning. That's that's what it's designed to do. You mentioned Kansas City and Cincinnati's in that conversation right now too. As is Buffalo. Fans always say, "Oh, once you have the quarterback, everything fixes itself out." But as you mentioned in the cap era, yeah. the gymnastics of balancing that heavy contract is difficult. What advice do you give to general managers that that come in and seek out your guidance of how to balance that once you have the big money quarterback contract? Well, the guys in Kansas City and and, uh, and Buffalo and Cincinnati don't need my advice because they're doing it well. Um, others that ask, I say the bottom line is not cap management. It's personnel selection process. If your process is correct and it fits the parameters of what you want to do offensively and defensively and on special teams – then you you can have a chance to get the kind of players that fit your system and 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 can function well and win as long as they're coached well. Um, the, the years ago when I first went to Buffalo, my boss Norm Pollum said to me, "Is that this game is really simple? Get good players and coach them well." And so now the answer is get good players and find a way to keep them under the cap and coach them well. That's the secret. And and it's very, very, very hard to do because, as I say, the cap is designed to handicap you in doing that. And uh, as, the, as the, the quarterback contracts grow, they become more of, a, a, of an impediment to adding the kinds of people around them that you need to have to win. So the idea of, oh, we're going to get the quarterback and now everything, that's a magic bullet and everything's going to be all right, that nothing could be further from the truth. Bill, how close, in your opinion, are the Colts right now in terms of their personnel? And the the Pittman situation probably plays into that contractually, but how close do you think they are? I think they're a genuine – I think they're a genuine playoff contender. I think think until um, the young quarterback grows and develops to the point where he can – control a game uh, efficiently, which means he has to get control of his remarkable gifts and channel them in a way that helps you win and helps him stay on the field too. Uh, you know, he can't, can't be getting injured all the time. 
uh, is 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 what has to happen before they become genuine Super Bowl. Have contenders. we have we seen enough in the small sample size to know that Anthony Richardson is that guy? Um, yeah, I think so. I think so. I think so. In talking with Shane Steichen and and with Chris Ballard, they're convinced that he has what it takes. And I was too when I met him. I mean, I was I was mightily impressed by him. And when I looked at the film, um, he got better as the season went along at Florida without a lot of help from coaching and the system. Um, and and I, so I think, yeah, I think the answer is yes. It, his his talents are so prodigious that he has to learn how to channel them. And Shane ha- and the staff have to help him by by creating situations where he can he can use those talents because there are things he can do um, that no one else in the league can do. And, and, two- and, and so you got to you you, you got to be able to coach that. In 2015, Bill Pullian got the gold jacket for the Hall of Fame. In 2002, he selected Dwight Freeney. And upcoming, he will welcome Dwight Freeney into that illustrious hall. I hope the golf courses in Charlotte are welcoming to you, Bill. And then afterwards at the 19th hole, when a jacket is required, you got that covered too. I appreciate the time today. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Bill Pullian joining us on today's program with Dwight Freeney being elected last night to the Hall of Fame. Good stuff there. And... Uh, interesting to hear, you know, with the two things that I that I took from that as we were talking to him. The first was, I, I don't mean to take a little nugget and try to make something of it, but I thought his comments about Jim Mersey and their interactions were interesting. The fact that he had texted with him, uh, but also his reaction when I said, well, did, you know, was he interactive? And I believe he said I was made aware that he got the message. Uh, but then also... Um, you know, his comments about Anthony Richardson and clearly Shane Steichen and Chris Ballard, as would be expected, but clearly those guys, Jimmy, believe that they have the quarterback in place. And it's good to see that people around the NFL or those that have done it at the highest level in Bill Polian view it that same way. This is a weird year for Colts fans because you expected to see that jump forward that I keep pointing to that C.J. Stroud had this season as a rookie where he's the one that's racking in all the awards the NFL honors. He's the one that Peyton Manning is going too late in the Pro Bowl games. He's the one that wins an AFC South Division title his rookie season. I get it. It's frustrating for Colts fans to have to wait an extra year. But at the very least, the likes of Bill Polian and internally the likes of Shane Steichen and Chris Boward believe they have that key piece. But as he highlighted, cap gymnastics with the quarterback contracts are very hard. The Colts have to take advantage of the luxury of this rookie contract they have right now with what they believe is their franchise quarterback. You know, in terms of Reggie Wayne, and I know that that's a disappointment for people and certainly a talking point, I get it. Um, Reggie Wayne's candidacy for the Hall of Fame, it it is weird. I I mean, Mike Chappell mentioned this morning with Kevin and Andy on the wake-up call with KB and Andy on this program that Reggie Wayne was a finalist a year ago but was not a finalist this year. But then again, Freeney was not a finalist last year and made it this year. I, it's it's wonky to use a term that isn't really a word, I don't think. Torrey Holt and Reggie Wayne being behind Andre Johnson now, I, I think that there is a little bit of, I don't think it's Colts fatigue. I think that's the wrong wording. But I think that sometimes players are assessed and evaluated as if they are put in equal situations. And whether or it's fair or accurate or not, Torrey Holt, for example, put up unbelievable numbers. And listen, I covered Torrey Holt. I mean, I, I I was there for every game of the first handful of his career. I saw him up close and personal. I was at practices the whole day. I mean, I, I, I covered him, right? He was a phenomenal player. And would have been a phenomenal player regardless, as we saw later when he had, you know, Mark Bogle throwing to him. I mean, he, he was a great player for a long time. But in people's minds, they think to themselves, be it fair or not, well, he was a great player, but he was lined up alongside Isaac Bruce. He had Marshall Falk behind him. He had Kurt Warner throwing to him. 
he had Ricky Prohl and Roland Williams and Ernie Conwell and Oz Hakeem, and it was the greatest show on turf. And he benefited from those things, and his numbers were inflated by an offense he was a part of. I don't think that's accurate. I'm telling you that's retroactively how people see it. And in Reggie Wayne's case, I don't think it's a fatigue as much as, well, Reggie Wayne had great numbers, but he had Marvin Harrison, and he had Edron James, and he had Andrew Luck and Peyton Manning thrown in the ball, Peyton Manning notably, and the other great players that were at Dallas Clark, and that opened things up for him. I don't think those are accurate, but I think that's the thought process. And as a result, Andre Johnson people look at, and the narrative on Andre Johnson is this guy had weekend at Bernie's throwing to him and had – you know, two guys that they found actually at the Fiesta grocery store across from NRG Stadium that won a lottery to be the tight end that week. And so, and the running back, and therefore we got to give him his due. I think all three of them are great players that would have interchangeably probably had equivalent numbers for one as one another in the same situations across the board. But that's just the reality of the way that it is panning out and the way it's working out. You know, John Stallworth was a great player and a great receiver, but he played alongside Lynn Swan, and so it took him forever to get in the Hall of Fame because people are like, well, they got Franco Harris and Terry Bradshaw and, you know, all these other great players. And then eventually Stallworth got in. And you hear Bill Polian say in that conversation that he is a selector, and he did say Reggie's time is going to come. I, I think in time, Reggie Wayne does get in. And – after that, I think Mathis is a, is a bigger question mark. Um, to me, Reggie Wayne is probably the next slam dunk or at least three-point shot to get in. I think Mathis and Saturday are really challenging cases. I think in particular, Saturday is a challenging case. I don't think Jeff Saturday will get in. I think he's a wonderful guy. I think he was a great player, but I don't think I think he's a very, very, very good player, but not a Hall of Fame player. Um, same with Bob Sanders, too short a window. So that, you know, the, we may be coming to the end here, uh, but still, pretty cool to see. Pretty darn cool to see. We got a two minute drill to get to, but we haven't talked to Indiana Purdue. So we'll do that next. What do student athletes say to.
So Brick just dropped a hammer that killed part of my childhood. I can't believe this. I missed it. I don't know if I can make it through the weekend. It's gorgeous outside. At least that's what I hear. That's the rumor from where we are. Well, did it start yesterday with Dave Calabro saying that? Yeah, Calabro told me that I made that I sound older than Calabro. Well, that was two days ago. Sorry. Not yesterday. Is that two days ago? Yeah. He only well, just recovered. Where'd he go, who, Eddie? Who's having the senior moment now, buddy? Not me. <laughs> so during the break, and we're going to talk IU Purdue here in just a second. During the break, Eddie, you took a phone call, and it was somebody wanting to know the weather line. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, I had a job as a telemarketer in high school, along with like 10 of my friends, and it was the worst job ever because you'd call and people would basically cuss you out and hang up. And one day they came in and they were assessing our, critiquing our work and they could read, they could see what phone calls we'd made. And one of my friends, they said, we'd like to know who it is in Bay 6 that called the time and temperature 17 times in 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> it was like Lloyd Braun trying to sell computers for Frank Costanza. <laughs> so it used to be that you would dial 317-222-2222. Now, the, in my childhood, the two most immediately like golden phone numbers to get that was one because you would call and it would say downtown temperature 56 the whole deal right i think we all in this room did it to some extent of course just to make you not feel old. and i mean i realize now that you have it on your phone but it's still there's a magic to it and and it, it was still doing it recently but i guess now it's no longer there somebody called to ask what the weather line was and it's like well i don't there's an app but um you know, but that's that. Now, the other one was this. And obviously it is months from now. But there was no greater joy in my childhood than when the Children's Museum would start the haunted house and they had the dial a witch and you would dial the phone. You would dial and it was a recording of a woman in a witch's voice promoting the, the haunted house. But we would. I'm sorry, recording or you, what? <laughs> that's right. <laughs> We would race home from school and get on the phone and just keep dialing, and it was always busy. And if you ever actually did get through, it was like winning the lottery. And then it was kind of like Ralphie in A Christmas Story with the little orphan Annie. You know, you're like, it's a crummy advertisement? Like, you'd finally get through, and this lady's like, you know, hello, little goblin. Don't forget, the Children's Museum is open 7 until 3. And you're like, wait, What? I thought I was calling an actual witch, and she was going to tell me what candy I was getting. What the hell is this? I didn't say what the hell. I was like in second grade. Uh, Indiana, Purdue. Speaking of things of yesteryear, but still big, obviously, Indiana and Purdue. Jimmy, the first question I would have for you was, is was any of the thunder taken out of this matchup based upon Purdue's absolute domination in Assembly Hall? Yes. Because that's a game, the first taste you get of this rivalry every year. What is it going to be like when they meet each other again? And I'm not saying that's fully the end-all, be-all deciding factor, but you knew how good Purdue was, and you weren't sure what Indiana was going to be this year, but you damn sure didn't think they were going to be what they are right now. And the way that Purdue handled their business, were never really in any trouble, established a lead early that was basically insurmountable, Yes, Indiana makes that run to start the second half, but like any team that needs to play perfect to win games, if you fall behind in an avalanche-type deficit out of the gate, you're asking yourself to really play beyond your means to get back into that ball game. I give credit to Indiana. They hung around for a little bit, but it was too much. And then that shifts to West Lafayette, and it's no longer a question for me. And this is the level of respect that I have for Indiana or for Purdue. And this is the level of heartbreak I kind of have towards my alma mater this season. It's no longer a question of does Purdue win this game. It's a question of how much do they win this game by. You know, I would agree with you in all areas until I remind myself that we said the same thing about Wisconsin and Michigan. <laughs> Right? I hope that happens again. I would love that to happen again. But truly, like I, I love Assembly Hall. I think it's one of the, and some people, even IU alums, vehemently disagree with this next statement. I think it's one of the best arenas in college basketball. I really do. I get it. I know there's not perfect viewing angles everywhere and the balcony sucks. I understand that. But it'll always mean that to me because I went there and I, I love the history in that building. 
That said, if you've not experienced a high-powered matchup in Mackey, you've not experienced high volumes in college oh, basketball. Fabulous. I, you know, Mackey is a great venue, man. Not a bad seat in the house. I mean, it's nope. perfectly – it's it's a great, great venue. Now, for Indiana, obviously there are a lot of question marks. There are more question marks for Indiana than Purdue. That goes without saying. Indiana may at this point be simply playing spoiler um, because, I, you know, I don't think – the bracketology, guys – it's easy to kind of poke fun at bracketology, because but I do believe this. I think that Joe Lenardi almost gets tipped because he is so accurate. I mean, literally, of the 68 teams that he will have in there, like 67 will be exactly correct. Yep. And you're like, man, is somebody almost like letting him know? Right now, Joe Lenardi, in terms of his bracketology, okay, the last four buys, Nebraska, Butler, Ole Miss, and Florida. Going to Hinkle tomorrow. Looking forward to it. Butler. Bulldogs and Providence. Last four buys, baby. That's nice. It's a good, comfortable now, feeling for them. What that means is the last four teams that don't have that are not in the play-in. Correct. Right? And that's, that's effectively, look, they could still miss out, but they have primed themselves in a perfect position in year two under Thad Mata with that win against Creighton last week. With the Big East being what it is this year, which is a valuable quad one, quad two type of league, they can very easily stay above that play in line if they take care of business and win the games they're supposed to win. They stumble a couple times, maybe they get back to danger territory, maybe they miss out. But right now, they are in complete control. I love the phrase. I'm sorry. Some people hate it. I love it. They are in complete control of their destiny in terms of what they want to do this year, which is make the NCAA tournament and maybe even make a little bit of noise there. The last four in, Mississippi State, Washington State, Seton Hall, and Cincinnati. The first four out, St. John's, Wake Forest, Colorado, and Steve Alford's Wolfpack of Nevada. The next four out, Providence, Xavier, Villanova, and Penny Hardaway's Memphis Tigers. Meaning, Indiana right now, if it wants into the NCAA tournament, Ticketmaster.com is a good place to start. They got a lot of work to do, and I don't know that they're going to be able to get that work done, quite frankly. Here's, here's what you would have to do. Aside from probably going perfect the rest of the way, which isn't happening, you need to win at West Lafayette tomorrow. You need to take care of business at home against Northwestern and Nebraska. Redeem yourself on the road against Penn State. You need to beat Wisconsin at home. If you do that, and there's three games left to play, Michigan State is still a quad one opportunity for you. You have to go on the road against Maryland, on the road against Minnesota. I doubt they get both. I've made it clear. I, they're not going to win tomorrow against Purdue. I've been saying since the Illinois game, the writing's on the wall for this team. Not saying for the Mike Woodson era. I'm not there. But this team, it's done. If they're going to suddenly change who they are and rewrite this entire season, it starts up at West Lafayette or it probably dies up at West Lafayette. Because, Jake, if they stumble tomorrow, then you start doing the game that nobody likes to play because it's a fantasy world, especially for Indiana because it's been a house of horrors for them since it's existed. Oh, maybe they'll make some noise in the Big Ten tournament. Maybe they'll win a couple games there. Maybe they'll, maybe they'll win the Big Ten. Like that, you start playing these real fantasy games. And I get it. I know that with Mike Woodson, they made a nice run a couple years ago and lost to Iowa. Generally speaking, that's not a place for Indiana, let alone anybody in a Power 5 conference. You can rely on the conference tournament to save your season. Right. Well, one would think, though, that, look. And they how, still do have big, to win a How big a two. step does Indiana take to the tournament if they are to beat Purdue? At Purdue. You, Purdue right now listed as the top overall seed in the tournament. You're still not in Lenardi's next four out. But you have suddenly put an antenna up of, okay, that Ohio State win might carry weight. You just won on the road against Purdue, and the Big Ten is going to afford you a couple more opportunities. It's not – I'm trying to think of it. If the Hoosiers right now are medically declared dead, beating Purdue makes you want to reevaluate and be like, wait, did the foot just twitch? Like, is he – is he the body still moving? That That's all it really does. It doesn't 
reestablish all of a sudden they're in control of their own destiny. The path for them is basically win out at this stage. But if you beat Purdue and you go on a nice little run here and you beat Wisconsin at home, I'm talking about five straight victories for a team who has flaws all over the court. If that somehow happens with three games to play, then maybe if you close strong, you're talking about a path. But you lose on Sunday, which again, or Saturday, it's not a matter of how or if they lose, it's how much. But if you somehow prove me wrong and prove the nation wrong, you give yourself a dream. Right now, it's just, it's, it's crazy. Fair now, who's guess. Butler got? You're Providence. Going to... Providence right there in the, I mean, this yep. is a big game for both of them, right? Massive. Massively so. For Butler, it gives you an opportunity still against, like the Big East is good this year. They're, it is. They're, they're very solid on a night in and night out basis. And for Butler from a, like where they are on a tournament trajectory standpoint, I know you mentioned they're in the first four buys of Lenardi. They have three quad one wins. They're only like, Head scratching loss, and it's not even that, is against a good Seton Hall team that, as you mentioned, is the last four in right now at home. No bad losses of the quad three or quad four. We're talking like 175 to 300 ranked teams in college basketball. They don't have a bad loss on their plate, and they still have a home opportunity against Marquette that's a quad one game, a home opportunity against Creighton, which is a quad one game. They're, they are chock full of quad one opportunities. They have four of their final what, eight, nine games here are quad one top 75 opponent games, whereas Indiana does not have that same margin and doesn't have the foundation that Butler has already built. But yes, Providence is a quad two because it's a home game for Butler and Providence is on the outside looking in right now. But it's a largely significant game for both those programs. It's another notch in the belt for Thad Mata and his team's resume if they get it done tomorrow. And on top of that, you still have opportunities to give a little stiff arm to those teams that you outlined, Jake, that are still outside looking in, in your own conference. They're going to play Seton Hall again. They're going to play Xavier again. They're going to play, well, Villanova, I think, is is in right now as it stands. But they have an opportunity against tournament teams or teams that could cannibalize them to push them off the cliff and be like, no, this is our year again. We're going to the tournament. We're returning in year two under Thad Mata. Kevin Bowen going to join us coming up at the top of the hour. We got a two minute drill to get to as well on a Friday and a gorgeous sun splash Friday, a Dwight Freeney hall of fame Friday and in Indiana Purdue set to play Friday. A we've managed to avoid talking about the chiefs, with Jimmy cook all day Friday with the super bowl on the horizon. A lot going on. We haven't even talked about Steph Curry much That's last this weekend? night in the performance and did it affect Ty Halliburton with buddy healed gone. That is next.
Now, I will admit this, and maybe I shouldn't. We were talking earlier about the Sphere. Tickets are on sale for Dead & Company, which I'm not a huge fan, but I thought, you know what, I'll buy two tickets and then uh, be that jerk and resell them. You're not a deadhead, Jake? I'm not. No? All right. My cousin is. 905 bucks face value. Seems a bit rich, right? On the initial offering. This isn't secondary. That's, this is That's correct. This is the man. initial offering. Nine hundred and five dollars a piece. Yeah, no thanks. Do you happen to know what they were when you two announced their residency? I don't, and that's a great question. I have no idea. That that is a great question. Uh last night Steph Curry was nine hundred and five dollars worth of good for the Warriors. Twenty nine in the first half. Um Typical Steph Curry fashion, you know, the net was barely moving. Somebody said to me, it's a good way of saying it. Do you think, Jimmy Cook, that in any way, shape, or form, the Pacers were out of sync or struggling because Buddy Heald was not there? No, I don't think so. I think that they have, like we mentioned all season, been a shaky defensive team. Maybe it factored in a little bit, but they got cooked in the first. And it kind of felt like, at least on that side of the ball, they were not going to have any answers for Steph or the rest of the Warriors and the way they moved through Steph in this edition of that team all night long. That's kind of where it felt for me. I mean, he he got everything. Like, I was talking to one of my nephews on the phone early first quarter, and we were talking briefly about the Pacers, and I look up, they're shooting 88% from beyond the arc. Now, Steph's carrying those numbers, right? He's six for six in the first quarter, but it's just, it's staggering, especially when... They're a team that this season largely appears to be, I don't know if I would say, because there's still years left on the contract of Clay Thompson, but they're not a play-in team right now. They're a team that's trying to stay afloat and maybe figure things out and maybe squeak in to the playoffs. This has been the back half of this dynastic run. Clay Thompson does not look anything. If you haven't watched basketball in the last three years, Clay Thompson looks nothing like the player that you were used to seeing. And part of that's father time, but it's also turned them into a, yes, they have some good players on there, like Andrew Wiggins, like Jonathan Kaminga, and Draymond Green is still their tough guy enforcer. But Steph is the straw that serves that drink completely now. And to see a performance like that, I would chalk it more up to they got punched in the mouth right away out of the gate, never really recovered. I don't think this is a trend. Certainly hope it's not for their road trip to close the first half of the season before the all-star break big ovation for trace jackson davis last night um you know it was not until the end of the game where he got in immediately got a dunk i thought that was kind of cool golden state kind of teed him up for that but it was a cool moment uh i would not panic per se about the way the pacers looked but we have seen there is precedent of times where trades interrupt the chemistry of a team i mean we've absolutely seen it evan turner comes to mind the acquisition of Andrew Bynum comes to mind. It can, it is absolutely there. Gosh, and <laughs> what you had to bring back those memories. It was the I'm piece that was going to fix everything. Correct, that it right? Destroyed everything. And when Evan Turner, I mean, I remember you know Barkley's like, "It's it, it's over. Give the give the title right now to Indiana." I mean, it was a huge deal, huge deal. And obviously, you saw how those panned out. But I wouldn't push the panic button just yet. Pacers Knicks coming up on Saturday night. That's tomorrow night in New York. Uh, we're actually, that's one of the stops we're going to have on the two-minute drill, right? Coming up in just about 30 minutes. That's right. But Kevin Bowen's next. The Ride with JMV.
Super Bowl Sunday, just a few days away. Conversation earlier with Bill Poling. You can get that wherever you get your podcast, highlighting not only Dwight Freeney getting inducted into the Hall of Fame, but also his analysis of where the Colts are at as they are chasing not just Kansas City and San Francisco, but also Houston within their own division. Join us as he does weekly. You hear him weekdays, 7 to 10 a.m. on the Wake Up Call with KB and Andy. Kevin Bowen, nice enough to join us. KB, how are you? Jimmy, good to hear you. Good to hear you as well. I want to get straight to the meat of the matter for me, as Eddie mentioned this to us right before we came back on air. Remind me what your son Max's streak is with helmet picks, and do I need to be worried now that a a kiss of death might have been put on my Chiefs thanks to one Max Bowen? Well, hard to argue results. 11-6 and six for the young lad this season. Uh, I believe, if I remember correctly, I think he had a stretch of he was either seven or eight in a row uh, until, honestly, the final week of the season there. He was a C.J. Stroud skeptic, I, I, I guess, in week 18. And um, C.J. Stroud got the last laugh, but he has gone with the 49ers. I was curious. You know, two helmets he had not seen all year. Um, they're obviously, you know, a heavy red in your helmet, a little bit less red in the other helmet there. Uh, but he decided to go with the classic. He decided to go with the 49ers in that one. So I will be tailing him as well. I actually think, I think it was an enticing MVP bet uh, for Sunday. That would be uh, Debo Samuel, um, $10 bet. You place that on uh, Debo uh, plus 2,500, the odds there. So $10 to win two fifty. Uh, that is where I'm going. 27, 23, 49ers to get the, uh, you know, get the segment off to a nice start with you. You know, I will say, Kevin, that it seems to me when I, and I keep going back and forth on this, and I know that Kansas City has a good defense, a much improved defense. And at some point we are going to realize our just susceptibility to being fools by going against Patrick Mahomes. But it does feel to me like San Francisco across the board has more balance in the areas where you need it than does Kansas City. W- would you agree with that? Yeah, I, I think that's a good way to put it. I mean, I think they're a super complete team. And you know, I'm sure we said a lot of the similar things to Baltimore. But I, still, I, I just feel like from a weapon standpoint, I mean, I, I, I don't know. Maybe it's premature to say this. But like Christian McCaffrey, Debo Samuel, and George Kittle are on like Hall of Fame paths. I mean, that's wild to think that, you know, one offense has got that at all three of those spots. Even Brandon Ayuk is a really nice compliment. And, you know, I think back to the AFC title game, and certainly the Chiefs played very well. I thought Kansas City set the tone early, particularly defensively and just you know, deferring. And then they forced the three and out. And, you know, Kelsey had kind of been un like the last few games. And then, boom, all of a sudden that opening drive, he makes big-time catch after big-time catch. And they're up 7 nothing, and Baltimore – is shell shocked a bit. You know, I don't think we can ignore Baltimore, you know, some costly, costly turnovers. I mean, if Zay Flowers, you know, holds on to that football, who knows how that game unfolds. Baltimore, I thought, also had just some stupid penalties. And, you know, I don't know. I just sense a little bit more discipline from San Francisco. But as I probably said to you guys, and I guess speaking to Jimmy directly these last few weeks, um, Mahomes in the points, the fact that I'm betting against him once again just sounds so idiotic when I say it out loud. Yeah, I look forward to liking your tweet when you you know, have, a, have another self-reflection moment on Twitter uh, after Sunday. Kevin, these two quarterbacks are on two unique trajectories in their own right. With Mahomes, it's legacy chasing. And with Brock Purdy, it is, you know, another Tom Brady type of lineage story in terms of where he was selected, but further still as Mr. Irrelevant. And here he is running this offense. And those are the two top storylines. As you look elsewhere, I know you've you, you've had plenty of conversations yourself in the lead up to Super Bowl Sunday. What what storyline non quarterback division excites you the most going into the big game? Yeah, you know it was funny. I was actually listening to a podcast with Jim Nance the other day, and, and you know he brought up you know just the tight end angle to it. And you know Kittle and Kelsey you know, strike me as two guys that are pretty close off the field as well. Um, is it as simple as you know the better tight end you know wins this game. I, I don't think we ever kind of look at the position necessarily like that, but, you know, obviously two extremely dynamic players. So 
Um, I would say there you, you could go, uh, um, you know, again, maybe not like super, you know, front facing like Nance and Romo are going to lead off with it Sunday night. But I do think San Francisco's defensive front, I mean, they have a lot invested into that bunch, even with trading to Forrest Buckner, you know, a few years back. And they made the move for Chase Young at the trade deadline. And, you know, I think anytime you are facing, you know, that, that, that group, it's a, um, you know, it, it's certainly a four man rush that you're you know, trying to create pressure. And it goes without saying how you want to commit as many, you know, bodies as possible to not only Kelsey, but certainly eyes on the homes when you're trying to drop back. So I would say San Francisco's, you know, pass rush and, and seeing if they can be consistent with that front four. And, you know, I had to laugh at the Nick Bosa comments uh, earlier in the week about, you know, Kansas City and, you know, what did you see on film from their offensive tackles? Well, I, I, I see they hold a lot. So I, I think that will be kind of a game within the game of, you know, how that Kansas City O-line, you know, holds up against San Francisco's front. Kevin, if I would have told you, Kevin Bowen is our guest. You hear him in the morning with Andy Sweeney on the wake-up call with KB and Andy. Uh, if I had told you, you know, a week ago that between Dwight Freeney and Reggie Wayne, only one was going to get in, is that the direction you would have guessed it? Um, that's a good question. I actually found it interesting, like, listening to Andy give his perspective um, this morning on that, how as an outsider to this market, he felt like Dwight had more national cachet than, than Reggie. And I guess I've never really – viewed it in that light and probably I should because you know ultimately the there are many more Hall of Fame voters that are not just you know Mike Chappell so yeah I, I don't know if that's Dwight's spin move I don't know if that's Dwight you know playing other markets well and, I think you know the, part of it Kevin would be this I, I I tend to agree with Andy I mean I can't speak for the out-of-market perspective right but the thing that Freeney did at a very high level he is just simply a position where there are fewer people that do it at a very high level. Reggie Wayne did it at a very high level, undoubtedly, but the receiver position is one where like there just seem to be more like game breaking receivers in the course of a season than there are truly elite game changing pass rushers. You know what I mean? Yeah, I, I think that's a good point, and I also think Dwight deserves some credit of like you know you oftentimes see guys you know move on and have a cup of coffee, you know, at another stop, and it just doesn't go well. Like, it's, it's kind of like, oh, boy, that guy maybe should have just hung it up. Or, you know, seemingly the new stop, you know, certainly has no emotional ties to that player, so they aren't maybe necessarily going to be patient with them. And, like, when Dwight was in Atlanta or when Dwight was with the Char or, or I, I feel like the Seahawks, like, he was a pretty good player. And, I thought it was key, and I think I believe it was the Atlanta Super Bowl run um, that they almost won. So again, it's not like Dwight just you know, left here in 2011 or 2012, whenever it was, and it, then it just didn't go well either on that end. So you know, part of me thought I, I, I guess I would have assumed Peppers was a lock, and I, I didn't think the committee would go with another defensive end. They 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 certainly did. Um, so maybe I would have gone with Reggie, I guess, over Andre Johnson and. Um, Tory Holt, but I mean, we had Mike Chapel on this morning. I know you guys have him on. It just seems like the the committee views Reggie in a very different light. Chap told us today Reggie wasn't even in the top ten. Uh, Tory Holt and obviously Andre Johnson got in. Tory Holt was above him. So um, now I don't think it's a guarantee Reggie doesn't get in next year because Chap said that Jared Allen was in the top ten. Uh, the previous cycle, and Dwight Freeney wasn't. And now that obviously flip-flops. So it, it, it's just odd, I guess, to kind of predict exactly how the committee is going to vote. And then certainly I probably, you know, who are the first ballotors it probably has some influence on that as well. Zach Kiefer had joined us earlier today, Kev, and he had mentioned that Kevin Bowen's our guest. You can hear him weekdays 7 to 10 a.m. on the wake-up call with KB and Andy. But Zach had mentioned that – he had heard maybe voter fatigue centered around the Colts and that specific era was starting to rear its ugly head a bit and kind of the same way you do with MVP voting where sometimes fatigue happens there. Does that concept surprise you? And secondarily to that, he is in a class where Tory Holt is going to be right there with him in terms of the same arguments can be made. And Jake's brought this up a couple times of – well, he was a, a second fiddle to Isaac Bruce. A, a, not second fiddle, but but a second weapon to Isaac Bruce, a second weapon to Marvin Harrison, plus guys like Larry Fitzgerald starting to come down the pipe in a couple of years. Where do you view his 
outlook of the length of time he might actually have to wait to get in? Yeah, it's a great question. I, again, I would like to think not very long at all. You know, again, when I hear Chap say to us this morning he wasn't in the top ten, I'm like, damn. I mean, <laughs> that means he's probably not going to go in next year if you look at Tory Holt was in the top ten. But then, again, Chap pointed out to us right. the example of Jared Allen and Dwight Freeney kind of flip-flopping from one year to the next. So, um, I, I just – the whole wide receiver position just bothered me how it's operated. Like I, I thought it was such a joke. Marvin Harrison had to wait three years to get in the hall of fame. Like to me, Marvin Harrison is the first ballot. And, and at the very least, it's a one year wait. I mean, oh no, you know, Andre Reed has waited longer. I mean, who cares how long these guys have to wait to me? It's if you've got a res- resume worthy of being in the top five, you're all, you are a first balloter period. And then if you are in the weird year where all of a sudden a ton of quality players, are first ballot eligible, then, okay, maybe you do wait um, to that second year. Um, the thing about Reggie that I, I just always thought, you know, b- he, he kind of belonged in Canton is what he did in the postseason. I mean, if you look at his playoff resume, you know, he took his game to another level. I think Jack was saying to us today, him and Jerry Rice, I believe, the only players in NFL history to be top 10, and I, I forget if it's yards or catches, both in the regular season and the postseason. Um, because you do have some guys that it is a little bit more whatever postseason heavy or you know regular season heavy and not as much postseason to do both I thought always stood out to me so again it, it probably is just a matter of when not if I'd like to think it's next year but again it seems like he's just not viewed in a very strong national light to your point Jimmy is it because there's Colts fatigue is it because they think that Marvin whatever, took the number one wide out, and, you know, he played with such a good quarterback and helped them. I, 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 don't, I don't really know you that. You know the thing, reason. Kevin, and you know this because you and I have talked about it on the morning show, but the thing that I think Reggie Wayne does not get enough credit for is the fact that he, Reggie Wayne, once he went through, are, are you taking off on an airplane? Or are you at the airport? <laughs> What's going on there? Yeah, I was just walking out to my car. Boy, that does sound like a pretty loud plane there. FedEx. Yeah. Is it nice outside, by the way? We haven't seen the sun in a while. Is it nice? Uh, it is Chamber of Commerce. This is this is unbelievable right now. I know the old no windows in the old studio really makes for hard. Like, uh, yeah, everybody have a great day. You know, enjoy outside. <laughs> I know. I'm afraid one day I'm going to say that and a monsoon comes in that I'm not aware of, right? Um, but at any rate, I, I thought that Reggie Wayne, I'm going to say reinvented himself, but I, I think what Reggie Wayne, Kevin, did that he doesn't get enough credit for is this, and that is that he was a behind-the-defense receiver along with uh, Marvin Harrison for the early part of his career, and then as he became an elder statesman, He became more of a safety net possession receiver for Andrew Luck. He did it with two different quarterbacks. I realize both elite, but he was a different style of receiver in phase two of his career than he was phase one, but the effectiveness was not changed. And you could make the argument that Andrew Luck's prolific start, even though that would have been the case probably with anybody, was greatly facilitated in the early years by Reggie Wayne's professionalism and the danger that he possessed against defenses. And I think that gets lost on people. Yeah, I, I, honestly, I think Reggie Wayne's 2012 season, Luck's first year, it just it, it doesn't get acknowledged enough. I mean, first off, he, he stayed here. I mean, obviously, financially, there was a lot <laughs> of reasons for that, too. But, like, you know, it, it wasn't a guarantee they were going to win 11 games in that first year. I mean, that you know, that just doesn't happen with rookie quarterbacks. And for – you know, Reggie to have stayed here when, you know, I think Bill Belichick and the Patriots, among others, you know, wanted his services. That always stood out to me. And then, again, he did deliver uh, on that stage. I think the other thing, and, and you know this well about Reggie, Jake, I mean, he's just not Miami University flashy. Like, I mean, when you think of the U and uh, I guess – University of Miami. Like, yeah, come what, on. What, what are we what, doing what, with that? What, how we how we break in tradition and go in Miami University? Come on. Come yeah, on now. I know. I'm like, is my sister-in-law going to appreciate that? I'm giving <laughs> o- Oxford, Ohio a shout-out with, with that. Like, <laughs> when you think of guys from the U, you think of the glitz and the glamour. And then when you think of the whiteout position, you think glitz and glamour. And Reggie just is not – he wasn't that style of a player, and he's not even really that off the field when you certainly compare him to other guys at that at that spot. Um, I don't know, is that holding him back at all? Like, I, Chap said to us today, like, 
you know, Andre Johnson just looks like a Hall of Famer. Well, I mean, sure, he's 6'3 and 225. And, you know, if you look at Andre Johnson, it's like, wow, that dude is blessed with some incredible athletic gifts physically. Again, Reggie is not this, like, 4'2", 40-yard dash guy. He doesn't look like Calvin Johnson yet. It was just a methodical way of, of getting it done style-wise. So, I don't know. I'm probably grasping at straws with some of this stuff, but just trying to make it sense because I think that's wise it's hard to argue that he's not a Hall of Famer. I've never understood the limit on how many can get in. Like, I'm not saying everybody should get in, but the idea of, oh, just five, up to five, that's it. It's where we draw the line because then – Look, it's great for us, right? It's great fan interaction. It's great barbershop talk. It's great talk radio segments. Like, in general, not mad about it from that side of things. But I think, and Kevin, maybe you don't, but I think you do based on your tweets last night and, you know, what you said on the morning show, what you said with us so far here today. Andre Johnson was going to get in eventually. Like, I, I, I think he probably gets in at some point. But there is some merit to say, well, look at what Wayne did in his career versus what Johnson did as his. And... That's the part that becomes frustrating of, oh, we set a limit on it and eh, fives it. Well, yeah, I, I don't get the whole, like, you have waited your turn, you deserve to go in. Like, I just think point blank, period. You, you Like, to me, it shouldn't matter how many years you've, you've been on the ballot. If you are the better player, if we're comparing A and B, and you're the better player, boom, you go in. So, again, that, that I guess, Reggie, you know, now being whatever it is, you're five on the ballot and Andre Johnson's been on it less, like, no, it it comes down to, okay, who is the better player? Um, And I I know positionally, again, this year's class kind of debunked that because you do have Peppers and Dwight Freeney both in. I think there are some years that they said, well, we've already put a light out in, let's go with a different position. I think that was some of the feeling maybe with Marvin Harrison, having to wait until year three. And and I guess while we're on the Hall of Fame chatter, I think Adam Vinatieri's first ballot next year. I, I know some would maybe disagree with that, but to me, when you're that clutch at a position where that gene is so, so hyper-focused and into game kicks get scrutinized more than just random kicks in the second or third quarter, again, to me, Adam Vinatieri is a first foul Hall of Famer. I'll be curious to see if indeed he, he, he gets treated that way, uh, I guess, come next uh, January. Kevin, what year was this for Devin Hester? Was it three? Uh, it wasn't was it first many? is my point. Right, I thought Pepper. I thought Antonio Gates should have been a first ballot. Because he was the other surprising one. The only reason I mention it is because I realize it's a little different because of the the fact that when Adam Vinatieri was asked to do his job, he was like the only one. You know, it, it's, it's apples and oranges to an extent. But Devin Hester is is somewhat analogous to Vinatieri's candidacy to me because Hester to me is undoubtedly the best at his position all time. And what he did, no one did it better than Devin Hester in clutch moments. And that's similar to Vinatieri, and yet Hester didn't go in. But he also didn't have the focus of winning multiple Super Bowls with everybody staring at him. You know what I mean? Third year for Devin Hester. But I I would agree with you. I think Vinatieri does get in. The thing that I've always said, Kevin, simply is this. Kevin Bowen, our guest. And that is, it is weird that a player would not get in one year and then get in the next year because it's like, well, what did they do in the ensuing year in between, right? I mean, the, the resume is complete, so you're either in or you're out. You're not, right? Yeah, and, and I guess, and that goes to maybe Jimmy's point of you know only allowing five in. I, again, one thing I think you're kind of hinting at this, you're pretty much saying it, Jake. But the difference to me with like a Vinatieri Hester is again Vinatieri on the biggest stage. I mean, if Jake Moody misses a 41 yarder to win the Super Bowl on Sunday, we talk about that for you know, months and the fact that Benatari, you know, delivered twice on that stage. And that's, I mean, we're not even talking about the tuck rule game and making that kick where, you know, if he doesn't make that, what does that do to the Patriots eventual dynasty and how all of that unfolded? I mean, that to me, like when you've delivered on that, on these stages, AFC championship in the weather, you know, multiple Super Bowls, that to me uh, is the difference. By, by the way, Kevin, <laughs> let, let me tell you one area where you're missed. We're playing copycat in here. Well, no, I don't want to stand did, Kevin, the only ever, one in the frame. Did you ever notice that when we would do the show together, I probably didn't do it as much in the morning because it was early, but did I ever stand up like we'd be doing the show and I would just stand up while we were talking? Yeah, I noticed it a little bit more later, but I will say there's been a few times I've either like walked by the studio or I've seen the YouTube. I'm like, damn, Jake is always standing up. 
I don't know why. I'm just, it's just more comfortable to me than sitting all the time. But but Jimmy's over here playing patty cake. Like I stand up, and now all of a sudden he's standing up and sitting down. He's mimicking everything I do. Get, do you want to? Do you, are you willing to sleep in for like a day, and we can do a shift, like a, cha- a shift change, like an ESPN crossover? Yeah, broadcast? exactly. <laughs> we'll get Kevin in here from noon to three, and then you can go down with Andy. How's that? Well, I thought maybe you guys were mimicking, which I think is one of the more underrated halftime shows. I I, I don't know, Jake. You might disagree with this. I think the Simon Says guy is one of the best people I've ever seen. It is. Job. A, he is incredible, <laughs> right? He, he's absurd. I mean, like, it's so funny. I feel like I've been at Pacers games where it's like, oh, boy, I've got 26 people left in, and the visiting team is coming out to warm up. And he's like, watch this. I'll get 18 people out here in the next, like, seven <laughs> seconds. And then, boom, people just start flying out of the game. I'm like – People think they're good at Simon Says, and then they go out there at you know the middle of half court at halftime, and that's I don't I have no idea what his name is. That dude is unbelievable. He is very very good. It did look a little bit like that. Uh, all right, Kevin, IU Purdue, your thoughts? Well, I, I'm curious to see a line. I was dead wrong on what the line was going to be for the first game, and obviously I, I thought IU would certainly make it more competitive than they did. I, I think 19 and I mean, a half, you, by the way. I haven't seen it. That's my serious? guess. That's my guess. I've not seen it. That's my that guess. Was, yeah, that was the Ken, you know, Andy looked up kind of the Ken Palm difference in the two teams. And, and I think the first one, the, they, Vegas kind of went off that. I thought Indiana would get a little bit more benefit than out at Assembly Hall. And then, you know, Vegas said, watch this. And they were obviously getting the last laugh of that one. Um, I, you know, just selfishly from an entertainment standpoint, I would love to see um, – you know, Indiana stay out of foul trouble for a half just to see what it would even look like. I mean, who knows? Maybe it's not going to make a difference at all. But, I mean, if you do remember the start of that game, Mackenzie and Baco, you know, certainly had a nice start to the game. And I, and I thought that was a matchup that if there was anything Indiana could point to as somewhat of an advantage, that was the one area where I'm like, okay, I don't really see an obvious guard here for Purdue in terms of that. And Baco, I think, had played a couple of better games leading into that Purdue game. But then, boom, once he got into foul trouble, then Mike Woodson, you know, grounded him for the rest of the first half. That was the end of that. So, yeah, I'm not holding my breath at all for an entertaining game, but certainly it'll be a hell of an atmosphere, as always, up there. And uh, we'll see if, you know, Indiana can, whatever, make it somewhat uh, interesting for, a few, whatever, 30-some minutes. The fan zone, Kevin Bowen, is our guest. Wake up calls KB and Andy, 7 to 10 a.m. on these very airwaves throughout the week. Kev, three games left for the Pacers before the All-Star break. All three are on the road. Jake asked me this question earlier. I want to get your thoughts on it as well. Last night, was it more indicative of Steph Curry punched them in the mouth in the first quarter and with how they are defensively, they were never going to recover? Or do you think there are potential warning signs of post-Buddy Heald trade this team might struggle? Well, I think what – it has to be frustrating last night and what Carlisle takes a timeout 70 seconds into the game. I mean, that was a team that got to the Conrad at three 30 in the morning and they beat you to every loose ball. Like that, that shouldn't, I mean, golden state is not very good this year. And certainly golden state is not known as a bunch of hustling, you know, guys on that team that do, you know, that's their calling card. Uh, that's not them. And again, they're out of the playoff picture right now. And without Clay Thompson, I mean, certainly Steph was historic you know, incredible stuff. I mean, one of the greatest shows you're going to see inside of Gamebridge Fieldhouse. But again, I thought from the start, they just beat you to loose balls. And every time you made a little bit of a run, um, those guys continued to, to do that. And that's not twice in a week. You know, it happened against New York and then it happened again. And, you know, you didn't have the, you know, back-to-back excuse on either of those. And so I, I think that is what has to be frustrating with that. I, I do think it's a very important stretch before the All-Star break. Um, you know, the Knicks are going to be incredibly banged up tomorrow night. And then you've got two bottom feeders in Charlotte and Toronto. So I think two and one at a minimum really is what you need. Cause I mean, if you start looking at the standings, which, you know, think about the NBA all-star break, it's not really the halfway point. It's more like the two thirds point. I mean, they are only a half game above the play. And there's two teams, Orlando and Miami right there, half game back. And Orlando has the head to head already on you for this season. So it's just, you know, you don't want to flirt with all of a sudden, whatever, losing three or four or, or those sorts of things and put even more pressure down the stretch. So, um, yeah, I, I, I don't I, I don't chalk necessarily last night up into like Buddy Heald hangover, um, but it is a little worrisome when it's like, yeah, okay, Steph was incredible, but still, I thought you just got out-hustled by a team that's not really known for that. Like, New York is known for it. Gold State's not. 
Kevin Bowen is our guest. You've already mentioned Max Bowen's helmet prediction, and you can get that on Twitter at KBowen1070 for the reveal on that. And you, we know now where your loyalties are lying on Super Bowl Sunday. But one of the favorite parts for a lot of consumers, especially betters, are the prop bets and all the different just exotic wagers that you can make on the sports biggest stage. Have you taken a peek at anything? And if you have, what is the strangest or most unique prop bet that you have looked at, are planning to bet, or have bet already? Well, I, you know, not to infringe too much on the show, but uh, have we seen the, some of the political ones? Those ones always make your head think a little bit. Have you guys dove into any of these? And, and, and if you would like for me not to go down this path, I won't. But Get, Hit um, me with one of them. Okay. Uh, higher in the game. Well, I guess what is higher? Uh, Joe Biden's approval rating or Christian McCaffrey receiving yards for the game? Oh, that's pretty easy, right? Well, uh, start looking up Christian McCaffrey's receiving yards. Start looking up Joe Biden's approval rating. (laughs) Well, you can just go across the hall to find that out. Uh, Donald Trump's (laughs) age or Travis Kelsey receiving yards in the game? Now, are we going? Now, that's easier than Donald Trump's weight because that fluctuates anywhere from 120 to 160, depending who you ask, right? (laughs) Yeah, he's got the McLovin driver's license, I think. (laughs) uh, I believe 77, if I'm not mistaken, on that number. But no, I'll I'll stray away from the political conversation. Um, I always love the touchdown length prop. Ooh, okay. uh, Over under yard and a half for the shortest touchdown. So, will we get a one yard touchdown in the game or not? Kevin, I I think that we will not, but I want to give you as well, and this is a tease to my plays of the day. This is a long shot, lottery ticket bet, but it's plus 5,500 odds. Yes, there's some Chiefs bias in it. Noah Gray, he's their backup tight end, first touchdown scored. I could easily see if Kelsey and Rice are bottled up and it's passing instead of Pacheco, maybe they go to Noah Gray. They did it in Green Bay a couple of weeks ago. That's my lottery ticket if you're looking for a long odds that could potentially hit for you. You know, back when I was in more of my degenerate days, I could always find pretty good, like, second and third string tight end touchdown odds. That I always liked those, you know. I, I guess the Colts this year, granted their tight ends weren't very good, but you just never knew who was going to step up. Okay, I like that one. Okay. What about our longest field goal, 46 and a half yards? Are we getting a field goal made Under. longer than 46 and a half? Under. Go the under. All right, how about this one? You ready? I just made this one up. You ready? Sure. Larger number, the final point spread in the game, or the number of fourth quarter cutaways of Taylor Swift? Uh, Spread. Think so? Yeah. They've done studies on it. It's not as bad as people have have said. I know it's the Super Bowl. I know. I know. If it's the fourth quarter and it's close and the the Chiefs are driving (laughs) and Kelsey has three catches, there's three right there. Her screen time will be post game. Or screen time we post game when they're walking on the field and he's smooching. Okay, how about tables. this? He's proposing. So get out of here. How about this? If I put it at plus 250, Taylor Swift touches the Lombardi trophy. I'll take that. You say she will or won't? Well, yeah. She, yeah, she will. Yeah. What if hey, they I don't mean, win? If they win the game, if they win the I'll, game, she's touching it. I'll run the Excuse rest. me? <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me? I was hoping that airplane was flying over. After <laughs> Eddie, cut that. Save it, please. Kevin, uh, you'll be, you guys will be breaking uh, it all down, uh, I know, coming up on Monday. This and much, much more. Uh, IU, Purdue, it's a loaded weekend. Pacers, Knicks, and, of course, the Super Bowl. And the first reaction you can get, 7 o'clock on Monday morning with Kevin and Andy. KB and Andy, the wake-up call here on The Fan. Kevin, appreciate it. Enjoy the game, all right? Boy, that's a tough way to head out, but, yeah, see you guys. <laughs> That's how we roll. Speaking of airplanes, by the way, Jimmy, you are again going with the cookie, correct? A modification. Really? I tried this yesterday. You know I always go with the Biscoff cookie Mm -hmm. at Costco. He's had a revelation. It's a Biscoff cookie with, like, whipped cream in the middle. It's delightful. So I'm bringing those from home for my travel. Okay. Eddie, you're going with what? I'll go with the goldfish. There's, like, four of them in there. You realize that, right? Yep. Those goldfish will last longer on the flight than the one that you brought home from a carnival in third grade. Uh, I will go with the little mini pretzels, eight of them, and a Diet Coke. Full can, please. Why do we ask all of this? Because, folks, we ask that you please put your tray in the upright position. 
please make sure that your seat is fully upright because we are going to fly around on the two-minute drill next. Nothing says I love you like romantic. If you're just joining us, where have you been? Uh, Bill Pullian joined us on the program at 1 o'clock today to talk about his selection of Dwight Freeney, who is now in the Hall of Fame, joining Pullian for that matter. That conversation will be up in podcast form. Is that correct, Eddie? And as already well, up. already up on the website. Zach Kiefer at 1230 from the Super Bowl. I am today wearing a Larry Bird T-shirt. And speaking of birds, I actually went ahead and paid a little extra for the early bird check-in for our nice. flight to make sure that I, unlike you boys, am sitting guaranteed on an aisle. Typically, I'm in the first class. No, I'm just kidding. Man, it really is me. I've never me believed here, in first it? class unless it's like a four-hour or more flight. Like when you get on a plane, and I realize like with points, it doesn't matter to some people. Sure. But when you fly from like here to Chicago and people are sitting in first class, you're like, really? I mean, even though usually it's a plane that doesn't have that for that short a flight, but uh, nonetheless, we all we will we will easy for me to say all board our flight because it's time to board the jet and fly around on what we call the two minute drill. Spanning the globe, it's the two minute drill. All right, our first landing flight takes us to Kansas City. Josh Briscoe, WHB 810 radio there. Josh, in terms of the Chiefs, they are doing anything different than past Super Bowls or this is business as usual in their approach? 
as far as I can tell, it's business as usual, which is an unbelievable thing to be able to say because they just have things like Super Bowl routines. Patrick Mahomes mentioned that earlier this week, and it's true. I mean, he knows what to do even when they're still playing games in February. So I don't know how much of an advantage that ultimately plays for this team because less experienced teams can beat more experienced teams. We see that all the time. But the Chiefs really do know what it's like to go through even the chaos of Super Bowl week. And, man, this one has been a chaotic week for sure. Josh, what's more important to a Kansas City Chiefs win? Their defense keeping San Francisco's weapons as in check as possible or Patrick Mahomes being Patrick Mahomes? I think I'm going to go with Patrick Mahomes being Patrick Mahomes in part because I'm pretty confident in the defense still. I'm also extremely confident in Mahomes being Mahomes, but it's still been about the supporting cast. And you saw throughout the playoffs enough moments of the supporting cast guys stepping up in that spot. I still think this offense is going to run Mahomes through Kelsey, Rasheed Rice, Isaiah Pacheco, but they needed a long shot to MVS to close it out in the AFC Championship game. I think they're going to need that again and just to play clean offensive football. I think the defense is going to be all right. Okay, a guy that you have not yet mentioned that if he has a stellar game, it would mean that Kansas City is the likely winner. I might go back to the defensive side then and say Chris Jones because I think if he is as everywhere as he can be, that's going to be a really good sign for where this team ends up. Now, look, the rest of the supporting cast on the defensive side around Jones, Noah Minahu in this game, after he tore his ACL, unfortunately, in the AFC Championship game. Someone else needs to step up, so I'm going to give an honorary mention to George Karloftis also. Maybe a, a little bit of a quiet answer there, but if he plays out of his mind and is a real number two option next to Chris Jones, that might be the guy I'd take the out-of-his-mind performance for. I think that would mean huge things for the defensive pass rush. Nothing says KC like WHB and BBQ. Josh Briscoe, appreciate it. JBB, happy to be here with you guys. Damon Bruce, our guest, longtime Bay Area radio host. You can find him on YouTube and subscribe to the Damon Bruce Show wherever you get your podcast. Damon, for Kyle Shanahan, the narrative around him is the collapse against the Patriots and another fumble against the Chiefs a couple years ago. How much of the pressure of that narrative specifically is on the 49ers on Sunday? Well, I don't think that there's anyone in Las Vegas with more pressure on them this week than Kyle Shanahan in a you know world where legacies are rising and falling by the down, it feels like, in a Super Bowl. Uh, Kyle's got to get the downs in this Super Bowl right because there's no one whose legacy, I think, would advance further down the road than Kyle. And there's no one whose legacy would be more prevented from moving further down the road than Kyle Shanahan if he were to lose another Super Bowl as head coach. In my entire life, I've never seen an offensive or defensive coordinator blamed for a Super Bowl victory or defeat like Kyle gets blamed in Atlanta. I think that's a bit unfair, but you don't want to lose two Super Bowls in your first two appearances, and the 49ers don't want to lose three Super Bowl appearances in a row, which is what this would be if things don't go their way on Sunday. So the pressure is immense. Offensively for the 49ers, it's the best collection of superstars you could hope to have together for a Super Bowl. Defensively, you could probably say the same thing about Kansas City with their secondary, Legereus Sneed and Chris Jones in the trenches. For the 49ers, offensively speaking, who matters more on Sunday? Their playmakers or Brock Purdy having the game of his career? Well, it all works together, doesn't it? I do think the best way to beat the Chiefs is to run the ball at them many times in a row. I think this is a heavy dose of Christian McCaffrey. Uh, it's the Christian McCaffrey Invitational with Debo Samuel being mixed in as a running back as, as well as a wide receiver with George Kittle, hey diddle diddle up the middle when the play action opens up because this run game I think has to be the focus to any victory that the 49ers might find in Las Vegas. Why is San Francisco's defense equipped to stop Patrick Mahomes, Travis Kelsey, and their offensive resurgent the last five weeks? I mean, I don't know if anyone's equipped to stop Patrick Mahomes, but I do think that the 49ers have the right chess piece to slow down Travis Kelsey, and that's Fred Warner. Uh, Travis Kelsey just cannot be getting a free release all game long. He, he has to be checked at the line, and he just, every time I watch the Chiefs, Travis Kelsey is wide open. Like, how's that happen? He's got to be on the, the, the top of the priority list for any defensive coordinator. So hopefully Fred Warner is the talent that, uh, that, that can stay with Travis Kelsey, not let him operate just unencumbered in space an entire afternoon long. If the 49ers lose the Super Bowl, 
That's called football. It'd be bad for business, but that's called football. They cannot lose the Super Bowl because because Travis Kelsey had 15 catches on 16 targets, 135 yards, and three touchdowns. Like that, that they got to take Travis Kelsey out of this game plan and let Patrick Mahomes beat them anywhere else. He's Damon Bruce out in San Francisco. You can subscribe to his podcast, The Damon Bruce Show, wherever you get your podcast, and find him, of course, on YouTube. Damon, always appreciate it. Hey, my pleasure. And go Hoosiers. Let's not forget the important stuff. New York City, Brian Mahoney, Associated Press in New York, covering the Knicks, Pacers, Knicks, tomorrow night in the Garden. Brian, first question would be, how does this New York team look differently and approach things differently than the last time they saw Indiana? Well, they don't have uh, nearly the same bodies. That's their first problem. Uh, you know, Knicks kind of overwhelmed the Pacers last time with their size and strength. Uh, they have so many injuries now that probably won't be the case. Uh, they're a real banged up team. So uh, I don't like their chances currently right now the way uh, they played the last time. Are the moves that New York made at the trade deadline, were those moves like Indiana did that were for the further out future or are they in win now mode? I think these are win-now moves. Uh, you know, we thought all along the Knicks were kind of going to wait till the summer and try and make their move then, but I think they realized they've had a great stretch through January since they got OG Ananobi, uh, and they thought, you know what, they could compete in the East right now. Philly is obviously has banged up. Uh, Milwaukee hasn't played to their level. I think the Knicks think right now, let's take a shot at it, and I think the moves can help them. You know, probably they have a shot. I think that they get the conference finals now with the, if they're healthy. At a glance, when you look at the Eastern Conference standings, yes, there's Boston, yes, there's Milwaukee, but it appears for the first time in a long time, the Knicks are there and they really belong there. You kind of took away part of the question with conference finals being the goal, but when you examine them and compare them to the rest of the East, do they belong? I really think they do. I think when you've played as well as they have uh, since the new year, since they got the Ananobi trade, um, you know, they've beaten some good teams. uh, And it's not like it's, you know, any team can go, you know, hot for 10 games. This was hot for, you know, 20-something games. And, uh, you know, again, they have two all-stars with with Brunson and and Julius Randle. Uh, They have much more shooting now than they had. So uh, they feel like they can compete with anyone. And, and, you know, and again, there's openings now in the East. They, you know, obviously Cleveland's had a great run, but the Knicks beat the Cleveland in the playoffs last year. They feel confident with that matchup. We don't know what Philly is going to be. So there's an opportunity there, and I think they are, you know, they think they made the right call trying to take a shot at it right now. Brian Mahoney, Associated Press New York. Brian, make sure Spike Lee doesn't choke himself on the sidelines. We appreciate the time. (laughs) Will do. Thanks a lot. Let's go to Phoenix. Phoenix Waste Management in Arizona. Will Haskett is on site for PGA Radio. Will, I will begin with this. I know the 16th hole is mayhem at the Waste Management Open. Is it just that hole, or is this basically a frat party for the entire thing? It is definitely the latter. Um, you know, 100,000 people sometimes daily for the week. The numbers are crazy. It's sold out for the weekend. Uh, it is the ultimate people viewing. The front nine, you actually have some true golf fans that will venture out over there to try and watch some shots, but there are still plenty of ways for you to get a little bit distracted in your an epic long one. But, yeah, I mean, there's, there's grandstands wrapped around 17 and almost all of 18, too. So it is the ultimate party, and I would say 75% of the audience don't know what a golf shot is and don't care to see one. How did this come about? I mean, I know that this has become a party in the desert with golf included. What is the origin of how it became that way? I think a lot of it has to do with the fact that, I mean, this is such a golf hotbed. So you already had a lot of people who were playing golf and would come to this area this time of year. And so they were already going to come to the tournament. It's typically perfect weather this year, notwithstanding. And so you already had that sort of base. And so at the beginning, it became a huge party for golfers or golf fans. And then it just sort of grew and grew from there. And the Thunderbirds, which is the organization that raises a ton of money for charity out here, just sort of embraced it and said, let's create something different and unique. And a lot of the players, especially in, in the younger generation, have gotten behind it. Can we do this every week? No, it's not sustainable. The players wouldn't probably stand for it. But for one week a year, it, it's cool to kind of let things go. And it can get out of hand. But you know what? Once a year, let's get out of hand. Let's get crazy. Nine events stand between this one and the Masters, approximately, if my math is right on that real quick off the top. Where does this event rank with events like the Genesis and, and the players and events that happen before the Masters? And what's the significance of Scotty Scheffler potentially winning this thing three years in a row? Well, it's two big questions. I mean, Scotty Scheffler just needs to show that he can win again and his putter is viable. And he's been really good on this golf course. So him winning again this week, I think, would be a springboard of confidence moving forward. In terms of where it ranks in sort of the pantheon of events, 
it's not a signature event on the PGA Tour. It's actually sandwiched in between two. Pebble Beach last week and Riviera next week when Tiger's going to make his season debut. So from a golf standpoint, from a strength of field standpoint, there are certainly bigger events. There are more marquee events. Uh, but it's it's unique in its own way, so it has eyeballs for a different reason this week. So I kind of like the fact that they were a signature event last year, chose not to pony up the, the big purse to do it this year because they know that they're going to attract people, and they're still going to attract a decent field. So I appreciate kind of where it falls because right now uh, we've had a really good run, albeit Mother Nature hasn't been very kind, of iconic venue in Pebble, iconic crowd and party this week, an iconic venue and field next week at Riviera to sort of wrap up this West Coast swing and get golf fans excited going into players and then major season. Will, when talking to personalities from around the country on the two-minute drill, would you like to guess what number you slot in in terms of our order? Number one. Number four. Needless to say, PGA Uh, Radio, Will Haskett, appreciate it. Thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Hey, come on now. That was too easy. It was too easy for our fly around on the two-minute drill. Eddie Garrison, while we were doing that, please, do you have the breaking news sounder? It is pertinent to the Big Ten based on the future of the college football landscape in the conference and, of course, with realignment. UCLA head football coach Chip Kelly is out in terms of being the head coach for the Bruins. However, it doesn't mean Chip Kelly theoretically is out when it comes to coaching in the Big Ten. Reports are he stays in the conference. He stays with a headset on but he does it now as the offensive coordinator of the Ohio State Buckeyes. I want to clarify one thing with that. Maybe you had already said it, and I just missed it. This is not a he was canned. This is a he's leaving UCLA because Ohio State wants him, right? Yeah, that that is my understanding as well. Because that's it's happening a lot more often in college football where head coaches are either tired of just being the main guy or ready for something different, and they're either taking coordinator jobs in the NFL or, in this case, for Chip Kelly – you're potentially taking a coordinator job at Ohio State. Very weird, given the fact that UCLA could have utilized a coach of his acumen and of his tenure to help guide them and make it a little easier, the transition to the Big Ten. Listen, I'm not an Ohio State fan. they got a ton of talent. I think I do think Ryan Day is a good coach. Uh, and the one thing probably that has held back Ohio State, odd to say when you had C.J. Stroud throwing up pinball machine numbers, but – you know, one of the things probably that has held back Ohio State recently or that Ohio State fans would tell you frustrates them is a conservative approach offensively and kind of having a rev limiter or a governor on what they can do. And with Chip Kelly and some of the athletes Ohio State's going to get, good Lord, man. I mean, look yeah. out rest of college football because they're going to put people in space. They're going to spread it out. They're going to score a billion points and uh, – I know Kurt Signetti said that they were coming after Ohio State, I think. But it's going to be a tall order for a lot of teams in the Big Ten. A lot of them. Uh, I see JMV. He is in here. He will join us next. He is not on remote. He is in studio today. And my understanding is, guys, 84 degrees and sunny outside right now. Mm, wow. How about that? Big if true. <laughs> well, half of that's true. Half, how about that? Uh, we'll come back and put a tie on it. Hi, this is ESPN's Mike Greenberg. and
week, of course, a lot of them involving the Super Bowl. But first, both of these are picks that are not going to get released by the books until tomorrow or late this evening. That's just how it works in the game of college basketball. Kevin Bowen asks is about Purdue IU. Lay the points with Purdue up to 22 and a half is where I would play Purdue and IU at Mackey tomorrow. Additionally, I'm going to take the Bulldogs on the money line of Butler, of course, as they host Providence. Don't know what that number will be, but I'll take Butler, potentially lay the points depending on where they're at when they host Providence. For the Super Bowl, <laughs> this is my favorite. It's the penultimate of crazy bets that will make Jake's eyes Do we have an animal? Roll. Do we have an animal? I did not be- I did not make an animal bet. Oh my gosh. Maybe you did, but I did not. And he's referring to an octopus. Uh, that's Jake's going to need therapy after this one. Give me the Chiefs on the money line outright out of the gate. I know big shocker there. I think Travis Kelsey also finds the end zone. Brock Purdy, under 10 and a half total yards for his first pass completion. I think they ease him into this game. I'm going under 10 and a half there. For Travis Kelsey, over eight and a half yards for his first catch. First possession of the game. Over three minutes and 15 seconds total length of that drive. I gave my pick already, my lottery ticket. Noah Gray plus 5,500 as a first touchdown scorer. And Jake, I'm not letting the Super Bowl go by without betting this. Tails, baby. Tails never fails. Give me tails on the coin toss. Eddie, you got anything? I do. I've got some Super Bowl prop bets. I got three. Uh, Both teams, as in Brock Purdy and... Patrick Mahomes, or whomever throws the pass, uh, to complete their first pass attempt. Patrick Mahomes, no interceptions. I do like him against that uh, dreadful secondary for San Francisco. And then Nick Bolton, he will be the leading tackler in Sunday's game. All right. I throw this one at you guys. This isn't even a bet you can bet on, but I just made it up. You ready? Yes. Most commercials from opening kick to the final horn. Anheuser-Busch, Miller InBev, Pepsi-Cola, Frito Lay, Google, or Amazon? Amazon. Okay, I'm going to go with Pepsi Cola. Do they still do they still sponsor the halftime I think show? It's still Pepsi halftime. Okay, that's that's a good guess. That's probably like a minus two fifty for Pepsi. I think they're probably the favorite. They will call tails. It will be heads, and the winning team will defer. Yes, I agree with that last half. I've minimum. always wondered this, like with the um, seven out of the last ten Super Bowls, by the way, have been tails. With the when they do the how long the anthem's going to be. Which you can't bet that everywhere, by the way. Like, you cannot bet that here. Couldn't the anthem singer just tell, like, a hundred different people, like, put down whatever you want? I'm going to yes. space it out. And then what happens if they get nervous and they go up there and they do it too fast? Everybody, <laughs> all their family loses money. I, mean, well, I think, You know, they've got the spotlight, so they're There's a maximum on the amount you can bet on that, right? Depending on who's taking the handle. But also, who's taking the handle? I don't even know what that means. Who's taking <laughs> who's the, the handle? Who is accepting the bet? The hell is By going the way, on? And it depends J- on J- how much you just walked out, and I feel like we need him here for the counter of just responsibility. Your question about rigging bets, Jake. That's why there's deserts in Las Vegas, okay, or at least in the surrounding areas of Nevada. Mm-hmm. Earlier, when I was talking about buying tickets at the Sphere for Dead and Company and reselling them, and Eddie said, "Well, that's because you're rich." I'm not at all. It's just because. I don't wager on things like who has the handle, right? <laughs> I mean, come on. Uh, Indiana Purdue. Leading score in the game will be Zach Eady. True or false? True. True. Okay. Zach Eady will double the leading score for Indiana. Ooh. No, false. True. Higher number Zach Eady rebounds or Trey Galloway points? Zach Eady rebounds. rebounds. Jinx. Jinx. Double jinx. Back again. Uh, J&V is in the house. John, you just came Jimmy's in looking. brother Bob yesterday. You yeah, look, you did. How you was he's frustrated. all pissy because I call Arrowhead a toilet. <laughs> it is, man. It's got the worst press box. Actually, you know I what? This matchup, this goes. This falls under the category of if you know, you know. Uh, this matchup between San Francisco and Kansas City, two worst press boxes until Levi Stadium uh, in the NFL. Candlestick and Arrowhead. Press boxes, total dumps. I just went to a, I went to the uh, divisional round and it was awful. I hated every second of it. Yeah, it was terrible. Got hit by ice balls, by a bunch of rubes, pushing bunch of Nebraska rubes, the, right? Pushing yeah. bus, buses in the snow, right? Oh yeah, <laughs> me and uh, Tucker Barnhart and Drew Storen. So it was a disaster. So yeah, Bob's upset about that. Yeah, he was.
So we, uh, I, I can't spoil it, but we have a running joke that I may or may not present to you if they win on Sunday. So we'll keep that in your pocket. A running joke. <laughs> so, John, what do you got lined up? We're going to do what we do on Friday, Bob Lovell. We've got lots of stuff going on high school-wise, collegiately speaking. Don Fisher is going to join us, Mike Wells of ESPN Radio. And I'm going to completely complain about that half-assed effort that I had to watch last night, which was unenjoyable. You think they care. were were they affected by the trade? Yep. I think so. I loved how did you watch Valley Sports anybody last night at the end when they were talking about all the kids that were trying to get the autograph of oh, Steph Curry and there was some old man standing right there in front of him, like nine jerseys on his shoulder. Yeah. Did I show you? I have to show you that. It was like Whitey Herzog was standing right there I, I with was his standing, jersey on his shoulder. I, I had to walk past the Conrad yesterday and it was it was like Beatlemania. It was unbelievable. And I wondered like when they come out to the bus did the there Curry stop? That's what JJ said. JJ said, "Oh, the kids getting a Steph Curry autograph, and there's that big fat guy right up there in front with his marker." And you're right; he's got other jerseys on his oh, shoulder, yeah. right? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. That that low life is putting that stuff. It's like me trying to buy dead and come. I almost sent it out last night, and I just thought, you know, I'm not going to. Yeah, he kind of he kind of looks like a loser, doesn't he? It's like Whitey Herzog in 1982. <laughs> Actually, he, he looks like Whitey Herzog, but he's built like the. He may have eaten Whitey. He's Herzog. built like the manager from Major League. I got another guy on some white walls. Forget yeah, about the curveball. Forget Ricky. about the curveball, Ricky. 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 What are you doing this weekend? You going to listen to the JMV Takeover? You and I Shannon? will be. We'll be driving around. Um, Shannon sings the songs. That's sweet. <laughs> she does. Mm, she it. wants some docking. I can docking. Tell you that I'm right now. like docking too. In my dreams. She loves that. I told so. you. Um, well, I sh- I'll just say she got backstage to see Rat, and then sh- when she was in high school at McNichols Arena in Denver, and oh, she yeah. and her friends are like, we got ba-. her friends like, I got us backstage passes. I got us backstage passes. And then they're like, oh my gosh, awesome! And they get, they got backstage, and Shannon's like, how do we get backstage passes? They're like, what? By the way, where did she go? <laughs> oh, oh, oh. That's <laughs> how you got back there. They huh? found out how they got backstage passes. Right? <laughs> Had to go get you a little uh, Tommy Lee egg roll <laughs> to make sure all that goes away. <laughs> all right, John's up next. Yo! We'll be back with you at noon. Enjoy the Super Bowl, everybody. The wake up call with. Kate. And Andy. Mike Chappell. There's two guys in league history that are all time in catches and yards, regular season and postseason. It's Jerry Rice and it's Reggie Plain. 